Hello, everybody. Welcome to the United May Day live event. Here's Jennifer. Unmute yourself, please. Oh, there we go. <laughs> and uh, we wanted to welcome everybody, comrades, friends. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight for our annual May Day celebration. Woohoo! Happy International Workers Day, everyone. My name is Jen Moxie, and I'll be hosting this evening with Kieran Fatima. Hello, Kieran, who is also the tech lead for this evening. We hope that you're all home safe and healthy and having a wonderful day so far. We hope you have had your very, you have your very best working class evening attire on. We all had to do a little dress up and that you're ready for an action-packed, inspiring evening of celebration here together. As many of you know, every year, for close to 30 years, the United May Day Committee of Toronto takes pride in recognizing and celebrating workers around the world, our struggles, our goals, and our collective achievements. We bring together labor, political, and international speakers with a rich array of talented musicians and performers and a variety of cultural backgrounds. So for the next couple of hours, probably it's gonna run past nine. So just, just to let you know. And in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, we'll be hosting our very first ever online virtual May Day celebration. So thank you so much to our tech committee, Kieran in particular, for making sure we got this up and running. And we're so grateful that you could all join us here tonight. This cultural event is meant to complement the annual May Day March, which happens today, May 1st, in the streets of Toronto. But of course, this year, due to COVID, we cannot attend the march in the usual way. So the May Day March Committee has put together a celebratory song list on YouTube and they've shared the link with you all tonight. And we've put it in a description link just under, under the um, YouTube feed, you'll see a description link and that's where you'll see the YouTube channel. There's a ton of great songs, really good music on there. Definitely play it all weekend. It, it's gonna be up for a while. So thank you to the May Day March Committee for that. Please share this link in this event in your networks. Use the hashtag United May Day and join in in the chat below where um, we will have, <coughs> excuse me, we will have some moderators um, moderating the chat. Um, so yeah, no abusive or oppressive language. Today is a day about respect, solidarity, and we won't tolerate any abuse or, or uh, language or behaviors. So just before we get our program started, I would like to introduce to you Elder Loreen Blue Waters. Loreen Blue Waters, Ichi Nikamun, Earth Song Wolf Clan, Cree, Metis, Mi'kmaq. Blue is a member of the Metis Nation of Ontario. Blue's family is from Big River, Saskatchewan, Star Blanket Reserve, and Brador Lake, Eskasoni First Nations, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Blue grew up with their grandmother learning about traditional medicines. Blue's grandmother also shared her knowledge of the great teachings. Blue is a college campus elder, teacher, and has worked with the Canadian National Inquiry for Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women, and also the National Caucus Representative for Toronto Urban Aboriginal Strategies. Blue is a two-spirit person, a parent of three, a grandparent of three, wow, a sun dancer, and pipe carrier. Thank you, Miigwech Blue Waters, for joining us and opening up this celebration this evening. Go ahead, Blue, just make sure you're unmuted and welcome everybody. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to light some sage, one of our four sacred medicines. And as I'm doing that, I am going to, um, first of all, uh, offer a land acknowledgement to all of us today. For those of us that are uh, here in uh, North America, in Central America, South America, um, welcome you all. Um, 
to the different territories that many of us reside on and, uh, and to acknowledge our ancestors and those that were the initial um, landholders of uh, these areas and uh, thank them for the work that they have done throughout the many, many years to provide us with this space um, that was left to us in a good, healthy way. And, uh, and I ask that uh, we in turn will um, put that land back to a nice, healthy way. Um, I ask tonight that the ancestors come and be with us, um, all those that have gone on before us and all those that are yet to come, that they come and be with us tonight so that we can uh, hear things in a good way, a different way than maybe what we've been listening before, uh, to open up our minds to new concepts and understandings and to open up our hearts um, to what's needed uh, in today's world. And then to also be able to um, have us speak in a good way to each other. Um, so I ask them to come and sit and be with each and every one of us today, all your own ancestors from where you come from, no matter where you come from throughout the world, we're all part of this, this land called earth and, uh, the land provides everything that we need for us. Uh, the land doesn't need us. We need the land. So I want to, I want to acknowledge that. And, um, uh, I want to just, uh, put out there today that, uh, you know, we are living in this COVID time, the first time that the United May Day celebration is being done live feed and not uh, um, in persons, even though it is live fed all the time, but uh, we're not gathering together because of this COVID-19 virus. And uh, I wanna acknowledge that uh, it's been a struggle for a lot of people, much like everyone's lives, uh, struggling with all the injustices that happen within this world, um, all the racism, the phobias, the unjustness that happens, the oppression, uh, the forgotten people that are out there, um, that we see you and we acknowledge you as a beautiful gift from the creator. Um, we acknowledge that uh, we're all spiritual beings living inside these human bodies. And, uh, and I acknowledge that each and every one of us is a, is a gift to each other. And to remind each other that uh, in Indigenous understandings, we have our, our seven grandfather teachings, which are uh, wisdom, truth, honesty, humility, respect, love, and bravery. And I ask tonight that uh, we share this message of love and respect um, because it is so needed during this time um, that we respect each other for the beautiful gifts that we are and that uh, we show that, that gift of love to each and every one of us, to everyone that we come in contact with, for all those that we, we know already and those that, that we have known and for those that we are yet to know that we can treat each other with kindness and love and compassion and gentleness to get through this trying time and to, to make things right with the world, to make things just for all of us. Uh, Cause we know that when one struggles, we all struggle. And uh, that's the way we should have our mindset that, you know, everything has to be just for all of us. Um, that's the only way that we're going to get through these times that we're living in. And the only way that we're going to move forward in a good way and to be respectful to our land, our land, the earth, it's so happy right now. I, I wake up every morning and I hear the birds singing and, and I don't hear all that noise pollution and I don't see all that pollution throughout the air. And uh, the animals are very happy. They're coming out and wandering around where they shouldn't be because we have taken up the land and destroyed a lot of the land. And we continue to abuse the land, much like we abuse our workers out there. So I ask that we look at things in a different way during this time open our hearts, our ears, our minds, um, and most of all, when we open our mouth to speak with kindness and gentleness and compassion. So I put that out there for you today and uh, you'll hear many good speakers today and many good things. And, and I ask you to share this, these messages that you're gonna hear today throughout your networks and with people that you know, so that we can all be in this together. I know that's uh, one of these catchphrases that's uh, on the TVs today that we're all in this together. Well, we've always been in this together. We just need to make sure that it's equal for everyone together. So I'll leave you with those words and uh, I look forward to hearing from the other speakers. And uh, hi, hi, Miigwech, and may the creator take care of you. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much, much. Miigwech. Kieran, you want to say hi to everybody? Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> you My were muted Kieran. earlier, so... <laughs> My name is Karen, and um, I know a lot of you, and I hope I get to know more of you. Um, I am doing a lot of the technical work for this online broadcast. It's been a very exciting, a little bit nerve-wracking, 
but I'm very much looking forward to this. I know my video is not the best quality for some reason, even though this is a Logitech camera, but hopefully you can hear me. Uh, we're going to be playing some YouTube videos, some videos right off of YouTube that you can see right here in the live stream. And we're going to start with the first one. This is a really cool video. It's called La Alegria. So I hope you like it. And then we'll be back in this room. Lovely. Alegra. Hope you are all dancing a little bit to that. It was kind of hard not to move um, with, with that. Um, we will be having some speakers come on very shortly. <clears throat> but I just wanted to give you a little bit of the context of May Day and what it means. So welcome to those who are just joining us. We have speakers, great music videos, and little creative short working class videos coming up throughout the program. Kieran, that was a fun video. How was today? Can you hear me, Kieran? Kieran? Anyway, I don't think I got Kieran on here. 
But today was a beautiful day. And I think it's important to recognize that May Day is about celebration, by recognizing the beauty of the struggle and what we've achieved and accomplished. And to celebrate that, but also to look at the things that we still need to work towards achieving. So the current struggle of workers today represents a long historic battle where workers around the world have fought for rights like an eight hour workday, the right to organize a labor union, health and safety protections, benefits, pay increase, just to, just to name a few, there's still need to work towards achieving. But as we all know, there are so many things that we still need to fight for. Imperialism continues to sharpen its claws and maim workers throughout the world. Workers are losing their lives on the job. The COVID crisis has truly shown us we still have so much to fight for. Migrant workers are being displaced by imperialist war only to be assaulted or welcomed with fascism, racism, and exploitation. So many fights need to be won still. Workers in every corner of the world are still fighting every day. Even today, workers at places like Amazon and Whole Foods are striking, walking off the job, because they are determined to work together to fight for a better future. Their vision is for a better future, and that is the theme of this year's event. The speakers tonight will discuss thoughts on our local and our global united labor struggle, as well as reflect on how the current COVID pandemic has impacted our current organizing and how we can use this unprecedented time to mobilize stronger collective actions. For instance, look at how the world has started talking about the needs of essential workers. Look at how much more we're paying attention to our needs versus our wants. So with that said, I'd like to invite Kieran to introduce a short video and then our first speaker of the evening. Kieran, to you. Can you hear me? We can Hello? hear you, Kieran, hi. You hear no? Okay, can you hear me? Can you we hear me? <laughs> I can't hear you. We can hear you. Okay. So, okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Let's go there with this. Go. I can share. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. This is um, our first ever live stream, Kira. We're ever. doing all right. We're doing all right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Google Chrome, for all of this. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, the next video that we're going to play is a little animation that was actually shared by Xinhua News, uh, the Chinese uh, news site. It was actually really cute, and we thought we would share it for everybody who might not have seen it. So here we go. December. Strange pneumonia cases reported. Roger that. January. We discovered a new virus. So what? It's dangerous. It's only a flu. Wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. Stay at home. It's violating human rights. Building temporary hospitals. It's a concentration camp. Built in 10 days. Show off. Time to lock down. How barbaric. February. It's overwhelming our medical system. Look how backward China is. The virus is killing doctors. Typical third world. It's airborne. It'll magically go away in April. Everyone stay at home. Violation of human rights. March. Our numbers are now dropping. Impossible. Look at Italy. We wore masks. You lied to us. We made our data public. You kept everything secret. Your people are now dying. You didn't warn us. We said it was dangerous. You lied. April. We said it was airborne. You gave false data. Why didn't you warn us? We said it was dangerous. The virus is not dangerous, but millions of Chinese are dead. Even though the virus is not dangerous, we are correct. Even though we contradict ourselves. Gosh, just listen to yourself. That's right. You lied. We did nothing for three months. And because the WHO agrees with China, we're cutting funding for the WHO. Are you listening to yourselves? We are always correct, even though we contradict ourselves. 
that's what I love best about you Americans. Your consistency. Okay, great. Nice. That was funny. I'm really glad to see this kind of stuff coming out of China finally. <laughs> Which brings us to the first speaker of this evening. We are very, very pleased to have with us Benjamin Norton. Ben Norton, as many of you already know him or know his work, he's an anti-imperialist journalist with the Gray Zone. Uh, he's also a writer and a filmmaker and the assistant editor of the Gray Zone as well as a producer of the Moderate Rebels podcast, which he co-hosts with editor Max Blumenthal. His journalistic work has focused primarily on US foreign policy, war and national security, and as well as media criticism, which he does really, really well. Ben is also a contributor to the media watchdog Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, or FAIR. And he was previously a politics staff writer and reporter for Salon and Alternate, as well as a producer and reporter for The Real News. Ben has broken a number of crucial stories on imperialism and American fo foreign policy. And you should definitely follow Ben on Twitter. He's very interesting and enlightening and very funny. So please welcome Benjamin Norton. Thank you. Thank you. I don't I, I don't know about funny, but I'll, I, I maybe I can try to be in this. I mean, we're dealing with a, a dark topic, but, you know, I think ironically, while everyone is in home, this is a moment right now where imperialism is really just escalating its aggression against independent countries throughout the world. And I know in the rest of this conference, this teleconference today, some other comrades are going to talk about the role of socialist governments and socialist groups in helping to organize communities against this virus, in working together to support poor and working class and oppressed communities that are ignored otherwise often by capitalist governments. And I think looking at the responses of some of these governments that are under siege by the, the world's largest empire, the richest country on the planet, the US, the United States, it's, it's very instructive to see what countries that are under siege and whose people are suffering gravely because of US sanctions, because of US blockades, because of military threats, because of intervention. These countries are also helping to lead the international efforts against the coronavirus. Of course, we've seen with Cuba, it's been absolutely admirable. Cuba, of course, is known throughout the world for its medical solidarity. We now have 21 countries that have Cuban medical experts that have brigades that were sent to help, including not only countries also in the global south, but countries in Europe, including Italy. And I wanna talk about that in a bit because that contradiction, I think, really exposes just how little these capitalist governments and these neoliberal institutions like the European Union and NATO care about the, the people, the working people who live in these countries where the tiny nation of Cuba, which is under a crippling, suffocating US blockade and has been a criminal blockade for 60 years, Cuba is helping Italy, whereas the European Union and the European Commission has done basically nothing. And in fact, we have seen an economist recently estimated that over a period of several years, the European Commission ordered member states in the European Union to privatize and cut health services more than 60 times over a span of several years. So we see these decrepit, moribund imperialist institutions like the European Union refusing to do anything to help their own member states, whereas Cuba has taken the lead internationally in helping people throughout the world. And of course, this is not new for Cuba. Cuba has helped after earthquakes and natural disasters and Ebola and other crises. China as well. I mean, it would absolutely be remiss to not to mention that China now has given medical assistance to 89 countries. That is nearly half of the countries in the world. And that is such a stark contradiction when you take China's response, the response of the Communist Party of China, the Chinese government, to the coronavirus pandemic compared to, let's say, the United States, which is actively stealing medical assistance from numerous countries 
and not only from countries that are, are, are so-called enemies, but also countries that are considered US allies, even Canada. I know many of the comrades on this chat are living in Canada. Even the United States has stolen medical equipment meant for Canadians. And what is the US government doing with this protective equipment? It's not giving it to the people who are most in need. Rather, the federal government is auctioning the medical equipment, much of which it's stealing from other countries, to its own states. So we now see a process, I mean, talk about cannibalization through capitalism, through neoliberalism. We see the process where the federal government is, is so blinded by capitalist ideology, which that is, there, the, the extent to which there is a US state, it certainly doesn't meet the needs of its own citizens. All that exists is to serve the capitalist class. And we see that right in front of us where the capitalist class is demanding short-term profits so they can profit off of this pandemic that is killing upward of 2,700 Americans per day. And of course, everyone knows that the United States is now the center of this global pandemic. It's the epicenter of the epicenter in New York and the US in general is the epicenter. So the, the stark comparison between those countries, I think, cannot be overstated. And there's also the response of other countries. I have been living in Nicaragua. I actually moved here before the coronavirus pandemic. I didn't even know that it was coming, but I'm actually glad that I'm here because as a US citizen, I feel so much safer, so much better here in Nicaragua, which has a democratically elected socialist government of the Sandinista Front for National Liberation and is also a very popular government. And the United States, of course, for many decades has been trying very hard to overthrow this government here. Of course, other countries, Canada has played a role in, in backing the 2018 coup attempt and there's still ongoing attempts to destabilize the government. And I've all, we've also seen how the right-wing opposition forces many of which are funded by the US government here, have been spreading fake news, intentionally trying to instill fear in the population, trying to make them not trust their government. And it shows once again that these reactionary counter-revolutionary forces funded to the hilt by Washington, they actually, they don't want the population to feel secure. They don't want working class people to feel safe at home. They want them to be afraid because they wanna destabilize the government. And this is a pattern we see throughout many other countries. And this brings us back to what the US government has been doing during this pandemic. Again, I need to stress this point, the richest country in the world, at least on paper, of course, that, that wealth is concentrated in the hands of, of the small capitalist elite in the United States, but the richest country in the world has done basically nothing to provide for its own citizens, even though the country is now the epicenter of this global pandemic. And meanwhile, while the US government is doing nothing to care for its own citizens, what is it fixated on? Crushing Venezuela, crushing Iran, escalating the new Cold War on China. So really quickly, I'm gonna go through these three countries. Venezuela, I have spent a lot of time in Venezuela. Last year, I spent about almost half the year, about five months in Venezuela reporting on the ground. And of course, everything you hear in corporate media is a blatant lie. I mean, it's so ridiculous. The idea that everyone is starving to death and there's no food. Now, the US government would like everyone to starve to death, which is why this week, the US government imposed new measures against two Mexican companies for selling food to Venezuela because the US government and now the leader of the Venezuela policy, the special envoy for the State Department on Venezuela is one Elliot Abrams, a convicted war criminal who helped oversee war crimes in Central America in the 1980s, including here in Nicaragua, where he oversaw the CIA terror war against the Sandinista government. And he also saw, over, helped oversee the US support for the genocidal dictator in Guatemala, Rios Montt, who oversaw a literal campaign of genocide that was convicted of the International, International Court. I mean, this is one of the few cases where you can say it is actual literal genocide that was tried in a court of law. And the US, of course, backed Rios Montt, the, the racist far-right evangelical military dictatorship in Guatemala. So one of the key figures working in the State Department in the Ronald Reagan administration at the time, who was brought back by Donald Trump, 
Elliot Abrams, is now overseeing the Venezuela policy. And just yesterday, April 30th, was the one year anniversary of a military coup attempt against Venezuela's democratically elected government. And we see this clown, Juan Guaido, who controls nothing and who was not elected, unlike the real president, Nicolas Maduro. And Guaido is going on Twitter, because that's the only platform he actually has power on, publishing videos saying, oh, the dictator Maduro is not doing enough. USAID, the US government's soft power arm that it uses to fund right-wing forces around the world. USAID is gonna help provide humanitarian aid to Venezuelans to fight the coronavirus. Of course, what he's not mentioning is that Venezuelan doesn't need, the Venezuelan government doesn't need humanitarian aid. The Venezuelan government has oil the Venezuelan government has other resources that it has exported. The Venezuelan government has local production that it uses to raise revenue to fund social programs. But the problem is Venezuela's resources have been stolen by the U.S., by Canada, by France, by Britain, by the criminals who are in NATO. And the U.S. in particular has also stolen Venezuela's most important foreign asset, which is worth many billions of dollars and this is called Citgo. This is the oil refinery arm of Venezuela. And that was used to, to earn a lot of revenue that the Venezuelan government then used to fund social programs. So Venezuela doesn't need humanitarian aid. Its government is very well able and, and willing to provide assistance to its own population. But the US blockade has prevented it from doing so. Although, of course, we need to mention that the Venezuelan government has put all of its resources into trying to provide, to meet the, the bare necessities for its population. The Venezuelan government, I've seen with my own eyes, has put a lot of resources into something called the CLAP food program, where more than 80% of the population, more than 6 million families in Venezuela receive basically free food boxes, providing the staples. So Venezuela is doing what, it's, what it can, but in the meantime, the US government, which last August imposed a suffocating blockade, what is now officially an embargo after an unofficial blockade, after many rounds of sanctions that began under Barack Obama and have continued under Trump, the US has continued trying to suffocate this country and is now even using a naval blockade. In the middle of this pandemic, the US government is threatening military action against Venezuela's elected government, threatening to kill more Venezuelans through military means after killing tens of thousands of Venezuelans who have died preventable deaths due to the US blockade. Now, really quickly, the same thing is happening in Iran. Iran also has, let, let, me, let me remind folks, a democratically elected government in Iran, unlike the US backed Gulf puppet dictatorships in Saudi Arabia, this, isn't a, this is not a republic, Iran has a republic and a democratically elected government that the U.S. has been trying to overthrow since the 79 election. Of course, the U.S. has been torturing this country since 1953, since the famous CIA coup. But we now see that Iran is suffering under one of the worst sanctions regimes ever imposed on a country after the U.S. unilaterally violated the international nuclear deal that Iran was abiding by, that everyone knew that Iran was honoring. The U.S. unilaterally tore it up and reimpose these suffocating sanctions. And during this pandemic, the US has continued to escalate those sanctions and Iran has asked for exceptions for medical assistance. While thousands of Iranians have been dying during this pandemic, the response of the US government has been no, we do not want any countries to provide medical assistance to Iran. And again, Iran doesn't need medical assistance. If it were able to export its oil and bring in revenue, it would be able to buy that medical equipment. But the US sanctions are preventing Iran, its sovereign government, from buying medicine and medical equipment. That is, these are crimes against humanity. Of course, Cuba is a similar case and that's not new. So finally, that brings us to the last country, which is really the most important country here. And I'm gonna conclude on this topic. And I know other comrades are gonna talk about the role of China. China has really played a leading role in helping the world while the US has been oppressing the entire world and its own people. And China, as I mentioned, has, has sent medical assistance to 89 countries, absolutely incredible. Not only countries in the global south, also countries that are members of NATO, that are members of the European Union. And what, what has the European Union done? What has NATO done to provide assistance? Of course, nothing. In fact, the opposite. 
NATO actually was planning a major military exercise to, to threaten Russia and also China, but largely Russia. And NATO canceled part of those military exercises in Europe, but still carried out some of those exercises. And NATO has continued expanding these military threats against Russia and China. Even Russia has provided assistance to the United States. And finally, the question of China, I think, is, is a key question going forward because we have seen since the rise of this pandemic, an explosion in xenophobia, anti-China racism, and hatred overall of anything to do with China, the country. And there's, there's the blatant racism where we've seen ethnic Chinese people in the diaspora just heinously attacked, hate crimes all over in, in Canada, the US, Western European countries, all over. But there's also a slightly more sophisticated, although not very sophisticated, chauvinism, and you could even say racism against China, which is disguised as opposition to the Chinese government. But really what, what this chauvinism is based on is this idea that China, a formerly colonized country, does not have the right to have an independent, powerful government on the international stage with an independent foreign policy that is not subordinated to NATO and the European Union. And we have seen increasingly China exercising an independent role in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And now we saw an explosion in the United States of anti-China hatred and scapegoating. And really quickly, of course, we should keep in mind that this goes back to the Obama years, the pivot to Asia. As with many of, of Trump's worst, worst crimes, they actually began under Obama and George Bush Jr. and have only accelerated under Trump, just as Obama began the sanctions against Venezuela. Obama actually was the one who imposed the, the suffocating sanctions on Iran and then used that as collateral to force Iran to the negotiating table. So we saw the so-called pivot to Asia under Hillary Clinton's State Department, which is really about the encirclement of China and the attempt to, to not only contain China's economic rise, but ultimately the US imperial strategy is very clear, to balkanize China. And they're even saying this pretty openly now. Two years ago, the US Department of Defense, the Pentagon released the first national defense strategy for in 10 years. And this said very clearly that the so-called fake war on terror has basically ended and the US has moved into what it calls great power competition. And that is essentially a new cold war. And the US sees China and also Russia as the largest so-called threats to US national security and is now dedicated to doing anything it can to contain these countries, to prevent them from growing, to prevent them from creating international institutions that are not controlled by the US, like the World Bank and the IMF. So the final note I'll end on here is I think we're, what we're living through right now is a historical watershed moment. And I think it's going to be the first major kind of proxy war, not a military proxy war, but a kind of political and economic proxy war in the new Cold War that the US is waging against Beijing. And we have seen that China has been providing assistance to the world while the US has been oppressing the world. And the US is of course using this to say, China is using this as soft power, as propaganda, as if the US ever provides aid out of benevolence and as if it's not soft power. And we're gonna see that escalate, especially in Northern imperialist countries in the imperial core. Well, we're gonna see this escalate rapidly in China. In Australia, there has been an explosion, even really before the United States, of anti-China bigotry and chauvinism. And it's gonna grow, grow more and more. And of course, John Pilger, the anti-imperialist Australian journalist, has a great documentary, The Coming War in China. So, so the last note I'll end on here is that I just think going forward that unfortunately, as awful as this pandemic is, and the global crisis and the global recession that it is going to continue to fuel with large rates of unemployment and economic problems going forward, there's going to be a rise of scapegoating that already existed, but it's going to exponentially grow. And imperialist countries and the far right are going to try to do whatever they can to scapegoat China in particular and say, this is all China's fault, the China virus. We have to do everything we can to unify the, the d numerous bourgeois parties in like the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, the, the Liberal Party and the Conservatives. They all have to unite together 
in this new patriotic Cold War to contain the Communist Party of China, which is supposedly threatening the world. So unfortunately, there's not a positive note to end on other than that we should recognize the role that socialist countries and socialist governments have played in playing a leading role. I didn't even mention Vietnam. There are so many other examples in helping to fight this pandemic. But unfortunately, going forward, I think what we're living through right now is going to be recognized decades in the future as one of the first major conflicts in the new Cold War. And anyone who cares about peace and who cares about preventing a military war between China and the US, they would of course be started by the US. Anyone who cares about peace, I think needs to be dedicated now to pushing back against this new propaganda and calling for peace and diplomacy. Because if there is an actual military war, it's gonna make this coronavirus pandemic as bad as it is, look like child's play compared to what happened. So what going forward, anti-imperialism, has to be at the top of our list of priorities as, as all progressives, and especially as progressives in the global north. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you so much for that. That was a very comprehensive um, breakdown of such a complicated situation. What did you think, Jennifer? I really like the argument that imperialism is, is the big enemy. Uh, to workers around the world and that we really have to be looking at that as the, the larger, uh, bigger fight while we're doing our, our smaller collective fights, but also with that as a bigger vision that we're always working towards that is like the biggest enemy and the biggest, the biggest fight to conquer. So yeah. It's also it's interesting really how great. China is vilified, uh, China, Cuba, totally. you know, these countries are vilified in the West, especially in the US, but also in Canada, mm -hmm. while China has sent aid to Canada and to over 100 countries around the world, while the US is poaching and stealing and literally just exactly. hijacking airplanes full of aid that's been headed to other countries, including to Canada. Exactly. So, yeah. Thank you, Ben. Thank you Norton. so much, Ben. That was great. Applause. Of course, thanks for having me. And thanks for organizing this. This is so important. And like I said, I mean, there was already an economic crisis coming. There was already a global political crisis that, that had been fomenting over years and growing. Mm -hmm. But now it's all, all of that energy by not just far right forces, but even the liberals in Canada, the Democrats mm -hmm. in the US, it's all going to be scapegoated on China. So in this moment, anti-imperialism has always been so important for anyone organizing the global north. And it's been one of the key contradictions, but I think going forward, it's going to be even more important to organize. 100%. And you know, it's uh, amazing how bipartisan their anti-China xenophobia is. So no matter who they are, they're competing right now on who hates China more, the Democrats, Republicans. Yeah, yeah, they, it, they're, you know, pitting, pitting everybody against China. And it's, it's such a big distraction too, in so many ways, you know, like what we're, we're talking about, COVID and we're talking about uh, like in, in this time of COVID, like I, I work on the front lines right now. I do a lot of community work, uh, shelter and housing services. So when we talk about food insecurity and, and uh, you know, our governments are making it seem like Venezuela is like, oh my gosh, there's like these lineups for food and everything. What, what's happening here is we have thousands of people still on the streets and not being able to get a proper meal here too. So there's yeah. so much hypocrisy in all of this imperialist rhetoric as well, right? So um, thank you so much again, Ben. Thank ben you Norton again, Ben. From Gray Zone. Um, and speaking of which, um, Ben represents a really incredible media site that discusses in a very critical way a lot of stuff that he touched on tonight, but a lot of the stuff that the rest of the program is also going to discuss. Um, we'd like to invite um, Dominic Bellissimo. I uh, just want to make sure that he is able to, to come yep, up. He's here. Yeah, he's good. Okay. <laughs> hi, Dom. Hi, Jen. Can you so, hear me okay? Hi. Nice to see you, comrade. Hi. <laughs> You've been busy with some education stuff, too, in the labor oh, movement. Boy, I've been so proud of education workers and teachers picketing and protesting and pushing the Tories off their agenda. I can't yeah. tell you. It took a pandemic to get them to stop picketing and protesting. Yeah. Well, welcome tonight. Thanks for coming Thank on board. You. 
And I know, Dominic, for um, a number of years, how many years now have you been a part of the United May Day Committee? In so the last five years I've been on the formal committee, but I've attended events for a decade or more. Okay. Well, then, you yeah. know, yeah, you know what you're doing when you do this financial <laughs> appeal. This is what we call it. We call it the financial appeal. Great. And uh, Dom, if you want to introduce why we do this, that would be, that would sure. be wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Hi, comrades. And once again, happy May Day. Well, I've been working as a volunteer with the United May Day Committee, as I said, for about the last five years. I was co-chair for a year or two as well. Um, I've had the pleasure of feeling the kind of solidarity that comes with working together collectively on a task. I know that all of you watching want to share in that feeling as well tonight. So I'm going to tell you how you can get that immediate feeling of worker solidarity and working together tonight. And not talking about the kind of togetherness that the mainstream media or commercials on television tell us about being in this together. You and I know that we aren't in this together with the billionaires. We're not in the same boat. They have different means. They have different coping mechanisms than the rest of us. We as members of the working class are in this together, and I'm sure you'll know what I mean. So here's how you can help. Each year, the United May Day Committee volunteers come together, put on an event face-to-face, -face, and cover our costs through donations that you will help us with. We also seek out and receive donations from organizations that you see have endorsed our work, have endorsed May Day, and from various unions that have also participated over the years. So once we pay our costs, which include the honorarias that are given to performers, we set aside money to donate to worthy organizations. And many of them have in the past been in the labor movement or have been in our communities. We like to donate to organizations that share our world view. So picture this if you can. Picture a virtual basket going around to each of you right now. Okay, I'll pause so you can have an image of that virtual basket that's being passed around. Now, you're going to be able to help us with our collective action tonight. So for those of you that feel comfortable donating and are able to, through PayPal, for example, you can make a donation by using the following address. Donate at unitedmayday.org donate at unitedmayday.org simple for those of you that prefer to and are able to send a check you can use our mailing address the united mayday committee can be reached at 58 albany avenue in toronto m 5 r 3 C3. And for those of you that would like to make a contribution in kind or have cash that you would like picked up, uh, please send us a message in the chat and we'll arrange for that as well. So this year in our discussions, our committee has decided, especially during a time of crisis, that alternate media echoing the voices of workers and those in struggle are now more than ever important. And so three organizations are going to be receiving some of the donations that we raised tonight. Well, the first, we were fortunate to hear from Ben Norton. So the first organization we're going to make a donation to is the Gray Zone. And as you've heard from Kieran and others, it's an independent news website. I encourage you to go there at the end of our event and see how dedicated the reporters and journalists are to original investigative journalism and to their analysis on politics and also on empire. You know, it goes without saying the gray zone receives no government or corporate funding to say the least. Now, the second organization that's going to be receiving a donation is the people's voice. Now for the past 28 years, 
one of the clearest voices in favor of the working class has been the socialist press, the people's voice. Whether you read it online or whether you subscribe to the print version, whether you receive a copy at a rally or a protest, I urge you, I urge you to help us donate and raise some money for the people's voice. So I also would suggest for those of you that are interested that you go online and subscribe to the people's voice right now. They're in the midst of their fund drive. And as you know, it would be difficult to raise money and subscriptions unless we reach out to progressive individuals and ask them to do that. So that's the second organization that's going to be receiving a contribution tonight. And thirdly, last but not least, is Telesur. The English link to Telesur is an important voice. Telesur has always been breaking news on very big events, as they like to say. They not only cover the events of Latin America and around the world, they also cover the events from a progressive anti-colonialist point of view. For the past nine years, they've been covering important news that the mainstream gets wrong on Venezuela, on Bolivia, on Brazil, on a range of countries around the world. Count on Telesur to give us a more progressive point of view. They also are guided by, in their principles, a commitment to excellent journalism, a commitment to teamwork and collectivity, and a commitment to social transformation in society. They echo the voices of workers, of indigenous people, of campesinos, and those in struggle to make society a better place. Now, I know I learn something every time I go to Telesur. Uh, we also are fortunate tonight to hear a message from Camila Escalante, and she has a few more things to say about the work that Telesur and Telesur English uh, does. So let me hand things over to Camila. Thanks, Jen. Great to share International Workers' Day with everyone. For those who I haven't crossed paths with yet, Day with everyone. For those who I haven't crossed paths with yet, I'm Camila. I'm a TV news producer and presenter at Telesur English, where we cover what the corporate and puppet media isn't allowed to say. In Canada, that includes the CBC and big media personalities employed to steer public opinion towards anti worker neoliberal policies in Canada and while also promoting an imperialist agenda here in Latin America. While some alternative outlets exist seeking to provide coverage of popular movements and the struggles of indigenous, Afro-descendant, and rural workers, the mainstream media works hand in hand to drive home the justifications for destabilization, for colonial plunder, and for coups. If Canadian media were any bit independent, objective, and impartial, they would dedicate more time to investigating, or any time at all, to investigating Canadian-based multinationals which are plundering the global south. They would give more airtime to those who challenge the interventionist and imperialist policies of Ottawa and Washington. Canada and its corrupt media has been a key driver of years-long coup efforts on Venezuela. The media spews and gives legitimacy to dangerous claims about North Korea, China, Iran, and Syria while giving a platform to right-wing takes on Nicaragua and Bolivia. Right now in Latin America, the working class throughout our continent is struggling to eat after many have no form of income at this stage, which is well over a month into lockdowns and quarantines with no government assistance. Right-wing governments of the Lima cartel propped up by Justin Trudeau won't be investing in the public health systems needed to care for citizens, coronavirus or not. And as people starve, human rights abuses and political persecution are intensifying under the regimes most friendly with Ottawa, like Bolivia's coup dictatorship. Solidarity with Latin America's working class involves discerning lies from truth and navigating through Washington's propaganda war and media terrorism. Keep supporting anti-imperialist reporting on the ground and let's keep in touch. Happy International Workers' Day, everyone, and death to imperialism. Death to imperialism.
Thank you so much, Dominic and Camilla. Thank you for that video. That was very well said. Very yeah. good. So she's Karen, great. We're um yeah, she's great. And I have to just just to echo a little bit about what Dom mentioned. The the you know, as a committee, right, we all decided that this would be um, these three media sources would be really important to to try and, and support and and uh, appeal uh, for some financing for this event. But we also think it's important to always support working class media. Like, so there's, we have Telesur English, we have Gray Zone, we have the People's Voice, three incredibly solid media information sources. But please, you know, make sure that we're always encouraging and supporting other media sources that always talk about the working class stories. And thanks to Dominic for, for doing such a great appeal and giving such a good rundown on that. And for those of you who are just joining, this is our annual United May Day event. The United May Day Committee of Toronto were, were a group of pretty dedicated um, volunteers with a pretty anti-imperialist socialist perspective. And we always get together each year to put on a cultural event like the one we're, we're hosting tonight for our first ever live stream. So I think Kieran, you, you'd you want it to um, maybe play a couple of videos, have people refresh their cocktails before we get into the rest of the speakers. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. We have I a video. <laughs> oh, you're all set. <laughs> um, we, yeah, we have a couple of videos to, that I can play that I think would be interesting. First of all, this is a video from Chile. This is a beautiful chant of um, uh, El Pueblo Unido. It's beautiful. So let's listen to it and watch it.
That was amazing. Oh. <laughs> that was cool. That um, was so good. I was sitting here just rocking my my chair. Is it, <laughs> Kieran, do you Kieran, <laughs> do you find it strange? <laughs> because I mean, we've been we've been working pretty pretty intensely around this tech stuff for the last bit, right? Mm -hmm. Last couple of weeks. I'm finding it so strange that we're doing this live. But I don't know. It's just, it's just, I'm still getting used to this whole tech live stuff. This is the very first time for me. So you might have done it before, but for me, it's like, this is my first time <laughs> doing this. Do you, yeah. how are you feeling with it? Like, are you feeling like, is it strange not having an audience? Well, is I've done a me? lot of stuff with an audience, but this is definitely different. Okay. Uh, if you watch the chat, the because the, there's a live chat, anybody watching, you can get on the YouTube and get to our live chat. That way, if you click on the YouTube link, um, if you're watching on the website, you can click on where it says YouTube on the bottom, and it'll take you to the actual YouTube link, mm -hmm. and you can participate in the chat. And that's where it feels a lot more like you know yeah. an audience and like people interacting. So. I think we should in incorporate, we should make sure that people in the chat room are part of this event because it's their event as much as anyone else's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I, you know, that that's helping me as well. Like, cause I, I got but three different screens open here. So I'm, I'm able to go and look at the chat a bit and go, Hey, Oh, there's some good conversation happening. Really good conversation happening. People are keeping it respectful. Thank you. This is very good. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know. Like, I'm just kind of like yeah. this. We're used to like being in this ready to dance and that kind of thing. <laughs> I don't know. Jennifer, you are ready, ready to, to dance. dance. You can get up and dance anytime you want. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> but there is a really good video coming up. Do you want to introduce the next yeah. video? And then and yeah. then we'll get into to the speakers. How's that sound? That's good. So the next one is very dancey and so i'm sure we're going to see jennifer get up and actually dance no, well you know maybe. <laughs> <laughs> i might maybe. shut my video off <laughs> <laughs> so we'll try we'll see but uh, it's a very fun fun video and it's by a band called well it's a musician called benny benny Esguera, Ooh. and I've got a I've got a little info about him he was born in colombia he's a Ju juno awards nominee Benny, Ruben Benny Asguera is a multi-instrumentalist, lyricist, arts educator, and community worker who has composed original scores for the CBC, City Life Film, Amnesty International, and the National Film Board of Canada, presented his pieces in festivals held in Canada, U.S., Cuba, Venezuela, Colombia, Chile, and is currently the musical director of several programs based in Jane Finch, Toronto. Ruben is a PhD ABD candidate in musicology, ethnomusicology, specializing in traditional and urban music. So we're going to play a video for you now. It's called Benny Esguera and the New Tradition at the Harrison Festival of the Arts. Nice. And it's a very fun video.
Nice. Oh, we have Jay Watts video is kind of getting a little bit of a feedback here. Jay, he's um, speaking of which Jay and Alex, if, I don't know if this uh, feed. Hi, everyone. We'll be right back. Hey, how are we doing? Are we coming through? Okay. I think so. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, we had a little feedback from uh, one of our tech guys, Jay. His, he was really, he must have been really blasting that video. <laughs> because it, was, it was really coming through. <laughs> and we all, those of you who know Jay, know that he loves his music. That was a great video. And I, and I love that there was some little tykes in the background. Because, Kieran, our next speaker is um, a really wonderful community leader. So Benny, Benny Escuera, just, I'm just going to mention that this video was, was by him and you gave such a great introduction there, Kieran. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you to Benny for contributing some of his music videos. But, yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, really amazing. Um, and my, my housemate is sitting over on the couch and we were just like, yeah, this is so good. <laughs> so yes, we were dancing, <laughs> but a, nice. a few weeks ago, uh, one of, one of my comrades shared a video with me, uh, his video called, and the song was called community work. And it literally gave me goosebumps because he, he mentions oh. all kinds of community workers, like how many community workers can we mention, Kieran? We have like nurses, we have child protection workers, we have shelter work, you know, he, he mentions everybody. And it was just such a, a, a really wonderful, beautiful song because so often those workers are forgotten about. And for those of you just joining us, uh, we, just, we just had uh, Ben Norton speak earlier. We had a financial appeal, the links are below of where we're gonna be donating some of the contributions you all make tonight. Links are below for the YouTube music list from the May Day March Committee. So please fill your drinks, come on back, because speaking of community workers, we have Pam Dogra, who has worked as an elementary school teacher and union representative. She is a community activist, that has worked with women's community groups, May Works, labor groups, and is currently a collective board member, member sorry, of the Toronto Rape Crisis Center. And Pam Dogra, I know personally, and is a really incredible person just overall. And thank you so much, Pam, for coming and speaking tonight. And I look forward to hearing what your thoughts and perspectives are. Are you, are you up and ready yet, Pam? How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Really Thanks awesome. so much for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. Okay. Anytime you're ready. You go All right. right ahead. Great. Thank you. I wasn't thank sure you. if we were going to um, a break. So thanks. And thank you so much to, uh, can everyone, you can see me. Okay, good. Um, to Kieran and, and again to Jennifer um for uh organizing this and and hosting this i think you're doing such a great job such an important day um and thank you to the committee as well too for inviting me um and especially dominic uh thank you so much um we all have so much shared struggles as workers and uh today is such an important day i was looking up the the history as well because uh, as was mentioned i am a I'm a teacher by trade, uh, so I like to, you know, information. Uh, and so, of course, looking up the history uh, for International uh, Workers' Day and May Day. Um, so it came about in the 19th century. And, you know, it kind of reminded me when I was reading it over again, reviewing it, reminding me of what this day is about is it is certainly about improving, you know, our lives uh, as workers and as people and improving our humanity. So, you know, when, uh, 
in the late 19th century, um, as I mentioned, in eight, the 1860s, actually, they, short, they uh, looked to shorten the workday to eight hours. So people were working 18 to 16 hour workdays. Um, and again, I, I see workload overload right now. Uh, you know, certainly not saying it's the exact same conditions, but I wonder in the current uh, economic conditions that we're facing right now, because today it was declared that there's a, Canada declared a recession. Um, what's going to happen? Because at that time, too, socialism, uh, socialist ideas were were new and attractive because uh, people certainly understood that the capitalist system was for the bosses and not for them. So um, I certainly feel, and again, thank you so much to the organizers because, you know, watching those videos really lifted my spirits. It's hard uh, being in this isolation or quarantine situation and especially on days like this when we're used to being together. Um, so again, thanks so much, this virtual way uh, of us being able to connect. So I just wanted to say a little bit, kind of situate myself and who I am. Um, so I, I was born here in Turtle Island, on Turtle Island um, in this place called Canada. And I grew up in Rexdale, a working class neighborhood. Um, my parents immigrated and, and I are settlers. And that's a new term for me also to start using. And I think the importance of it. Um, of course, within a context, my parents immigrated from India and it was, uh, you know, they were born and also moved during the time of partition and, you know, all the colonization and imperialism in India, uh, I'm sure you all know about very well. So um, sort of fleeing the terror uh, of that is what did sort of bring them here. Um, and so just to always recognize my solidarity with the indigenous peoples of this land and, uh, you know, our, my responsibility to acknowledge this unjust system um, and uh, which also, you know, again, as a settler, in some ways, my family has benefited also. It's a very complicated relationship uh, in many ways, but very important, I think, for, uh, I know, for me to acknowledge in my understanding and um, of, of this brutal, violent system that we have. Um, so I, I wanted to just make that, uh, just talk a little bit about that. And then I'm just gonna get into a little bit of the background. Uh, I'm gonna be focusing mostly on the teacher struggle, um, you know, the strikes that happen and education workers, uh, you know, which we struggled through this fall and into the winter. Um, so I'm gonna just say a little bit about the background though, just in terms of, of course, uh, neoliberalism and the past 40 years really in, in creating a, a crisis of sorts and specifically in the 1990s, uh, Harris's common sense revolution. And there was a huge amalgamation, for instance, of many school boards. There were so many things that happened and I'm not gonna get into all of that, but just to give a background in terms of maybe how education workers kind of became a bit more radicalized. Cause at that time in the, you know, uh, teachers were not in the labor movement actually. And it is because the silver lining, I guess, uh, from Harris was that we joined the labor movement at that time. And I say we meaning teachers. Um, and so that was, uh, you know, in a way a very positive step. Um, but again, it came at the cost and still is, you know, the funding is still, uh, you know, never been restored uh, since uh, the Tories at that time. Uh, and we've had to, uh, you know, certainly, when the conservatives left in 2002 the liberals came in and you know there were some improvements made we could say but uh they're around supervision and and pro and like you know around uh, some caps around class sizes which were very important and we were looking for those changes however again now 2008 still a liberal government also attacked us uh in terms of uh retirement gratuities uh attacking uh, sick uh, sick leave which was happening to public sector workers at that time as well so uh, there was also a huge cry from our members around uh, class size. We as teachers were struggling uh, around really large class sizes and still are unfortunately today. Um, and the underfunding, as I mentioned, wasn't fixed. So, um, you know, violence continued to go on the rise in schools because of the education cuts that they made. So a lot of education workers like educational assistants uh, were cut and these were, feel, these were felt in the classroom, certainly for, uh, students who are more vulnerable, uh, special education students. Um, and so, you know, deteriorating the system, underfunding it, and then again, attacking our working conditions as well. Um, so, um, you know, 
some of the things, so again, sort of the silver lining, as I mentioned, uh, was in a way that we were became part of the labor movement. And again, me personally, why I became more involved in the union uh, in around the 2004 uh, time was because I was really interested in a broader social issues and the union's, uh, you know, uh, involvement in that. And because of what had happened uh, with Harris and the Days of Action, um, you know, there was this also this way to sort of uh, become part of that and have this organizing that was happening as well amongst teachers that, you know, were watching our students suffer and our community suffer as well, too. So uh, the, the union certainly was a place so that, you know, in order to organize, uh, you know, not perfect, of course, but, you know, at the same time, still a, a place where we could gather and uh, look at you know what our principles are and that was a uh, very important and again helped around our organizing for currently and so i'm going to move on to like sort of what were the issues just before we went on strike and what what were the members talking about and what was happening in schools uh you know there again a real increase in violence and we connect that to again lack of supports uh for students right uh, large class sizes uh, also, and so the ballooning class sizes when you have a maybe a grade eight class of 40 students, it's really difficult, uh, you know, to manage. And of course, the students are you want to be able to help them through the with the attention that they need. Health and safety, building is deteriorating, particularly in Toronto, and I know elsewhere as well, too. There's so many issues in rural communities and remote communities, um, again, around all kinds of issues, uh, you know, even around. Uh, you know, sort of having enough schools, because again, through amalgamation, there was a lot of issues. Um, and then we had, there was an election, of course, of the Ford government, the conservative government, and we knew we were, you know, we knew that the demands were around class size, uh, benefits were also a, a really big problem. So, um, and then we had this conservative government. So, you know, we got, you know, we also at the same time were so influenced by, you know, the United States and the Red for Ed movement and uh, other uh, provinces as well to have taken that on as an inspiration to around these attacks. And again, talking about neoliberalism and the attack on public education and public services. Uh, so um, we took a lot of inspiration to that to organize around these issues because we knew with a conservative government what, uh, you know, we would have a really uh, big fight on our hands. And so, you know, um, I, I'll talk about some of the issues. They attacked uh, the sick leave uh, again. And this is they attacked it for all of the education unions, not just elementary school teachers, but high school teachers, CUPE. Um, there's also the Catholic teachers as well, too. They were so this was because uh, we do the central bargaining. And so they wanted to attack, again, the sick leave, reduce them yet further. Again, uh, we had a, a charter uh, challenge against uh, in 2008 against the Liberal government, which we actually won, Supreme Court. Um, they upheld that our uh, bargaining rights were fettered with. And so anyways, they again, we're dealing with a sick leave issue and they took away our sick leave banks um, and they didn't do that uh, through the bargaining process. So, you know, here we are again, now a conservative government. Yeah, anyways, but uh, now we're, we're dealing with sick leave reduction uh, again. Uh, so, you know, again, we, the other unions as well put up a fight, a very solid fight around this. We really came together around a lot of issues. Uh, but again, the tricks, you know, they were talking earlier about the media and uh, how difficult it is. And, you know, the Minister of Education right now, he's a PR specialist. So, uh, you know, he's very interested in communications. And our experience during the, this time of strike was really a difficult lot of, you know, lies uh, that we had to dispel, which I think uh, was, you know, again, all the unions are a very good job around it. Uh, there was issues around e-learning, uh, and now look at where we are in terms of COVID. It's very, you know, who would have expected that we would have uh, been in this situation, but the e-learning and all the problems with it, and uh, but they wanted to push e-learning, of course, and there was no research, no research to back this up in any way that e-learning was a good idea. I think they were getting stuff out of the United States, out of Alabama, and uh, it was really not good research at all. So again, they were creating a crisis of debt. That was also the time that they were talking about. They asked our ETFO specifically for 150 uh, million to find inefficiencies that we had to, we don't know where, sort of arbitrary, um, and you know, never looked at or never addressed the fact that they've given away money to corporations 
or anything like that. That was never, uh, never talked about. So we ran campaigns, really great campaigns and ones that really resonated with the public and parents. We had huge support um, because our issues are very popular issues. And when um, even the conservative government did surveys, which they wouldn't uh, release because they actually did show that parents did not want an increase to class size. They didn't want the things the conservative government was saying uh, that that uh, parents wanted. Uh, but it was very difficult around uh, seniority rights. They um, took that issue uh, particularly to divide our membership, I believe, uh, and, and divide people around that um, issue. And uh, so that was a really huge problem at, around people even just understanding what seniority is. Um, and they really just wanted to get back to nepotism uh, when it comes to hiring of new, uh, you could say, teachers. So it, it's uh, it was very tricky, and uh, you know, but that caught steam. Definitely was this kind of this idea of a meritocracy, uh, and uh, so that was again using sort of the media. And then there was the salary. Again, they imposed a one percent uh, on all, uh, you know, public sector workers, which again is a wide range of incomes. So when you're saying you're only going to improve 1% for a person that's making $40,000 a year, 1% is not much at all. It's nothing. So we, uh, again, uh, you know, lobbied and our members cert uh, certainly uh, wanted not just a 1% because, again, all our members don't exactly make the same amount of money either. But that was another thing, a real attack on um salaries and making it seem as though i think i mean he you know sort of blatantly coming out with lies saying that teachers are the most the most i don't know richest paid people like it was uh very uh disconcerting and uh, very upsetting and as well for a lot of the teachers to be hearing the kinds of lies and again 80 percent of our members are women as well too so um you know certainly those conversations also were had around this this attack uh again on education workers, and we know a lot of them are being are women. Um, that again, a deterioration of of women's working conditions that you know have taken so many decades to to fight for, as we know. Um, so that was you know what we struggled for. We you know the thing was was that we did strike for six days, and we had a re amazing like the members were so solid and they were great. The economic times, of course, are tough. They're very tough now, but they were tough then too. So. It, it was really, uh, again, also kind of unbelievable to see the government not respond. Uh, you know, that to me was a bit frightening in a way too, uh, that they were not responding to, uh, you know, the, the closing of the school. So they, they were in the sense of at the table. So that, that uh, was disconcerting, but our members were amazing. Uh, and so were, again, OSSTF members and AEFO and QB and, uh, like everyone uh, in this struggle, you know, I think the members and really did a fantastic job uh, and also even in terms of engaging the public. So again, those are like hopeful things, but at the end of it, I have to say, you know, we just ratified the agreement and there was, uh, it was really good numbers. Uh, at the same, um, sorry, uh, at the same time though, uh, you know, when we're in this COVID situation, we, we had to deal with that uh, at the same time. And even with the six days of striking, you know, we had to, we defended uh, the agreement, you know, because they wanted to do cuts. And of course we ran a campaign, Cuts Hurt Kids, but um, it was pretty much a status quo kind of, you know, thing. Uh, and we were very happy that we were able to defend those things, but, you know, it uh, shouldn't be, of course, that way. As we know, we should be looking for improvements to our public education system for our communities. Uh, we, we need them desperately. And again, I'm gonna actually, now go into kind of COVID and broader issues around non-unionized workers. I know migrant workers have been mentioned uh, as well and undocumented workers as well too. And of course we know um, even with our uh, situation, we, we actually have local bargaining uh, still happening. And uh, you know we know that other workers are in much worse uh, position in terms of no sick leave. You know, many, one million job losses across Canada, uh, you know, during March alone. Um, so many people have been laid off. Um, and so, you know, we're, you know, how do you bargain in a context like that as well, too, is uh, quite interesting. And I think it was mentioned before, too, like, 
you know, our actions are always together. We're together. It's a big part of resistance. So I think we need to really be thinking about how do we keep this momentum up? Because again, the popular view seems to be uh, that we do have a strong public education system. So how do we keep uh, that kind of sentiment uh, going, especially, you know, after this and as we're facing such a, you know, and we know that they're getting ready, they have plans for us to privatize probably, you know, everything, every corner if they can. Uh, so how do we, What? how is the resistance going to look like? And uh, I think, I guess, right now would be the time for reflection on that uh, and for us to continue because it is, uh, I know that there are workers, uh, Amazon was mentioned as well. Uh, but it is quite uh, difficult at the same time. Um, so, you know, the impact on workers and communities in the working class and Indigenous, Black and people of colour and women of colour are also extremely greatly impacted, even more so. We know that intimate partner violence has increasing in Brazil. It's up by 40 to 50 percent. Um, and so there's a lot of isolation and it's difficult to get help uh, if you're sort of trapped in the room uh, with a person that, uh, you know, uh, is violent towards you. Um, and then, of course, housing, right? Uh, many families uh, are, you know, are living in very small spaces and it's very, very difficult. Um, so I think, like, I know the 15 in fairness, um, they are demanding a total of 21 uh, paid sick leave. So if you go to their website, uh, they do have a campaign going on. Um, and what they're saying is that, uh, you know, you some of you may remember Bill 148 that the Liberals did bring in and that guaranteed two sick days, paid sick days for all workers. And uh, although very small that number is, uh, it was there. And then the Conservatives, of course, came and, and took that away. So what uh, is being demanded now now with COVID is 21 paid sick days, seven permanently, all the time should be available to all workers and uh, 14 in emergency outbreak. So a total of 21. You know, more people need access uh, for assistance. Again, migrant groups have lobbied and have achieved changes, which has been pretty incredible, but it still doesn't include, for instance, undocumented workers. So there's a lot of work, and I know a lot of community coming together to try to do that work. So I know there's pots and pans at 7.30, but also people are trying to communicate with each other in, in really creative ways. So you might want to uh, look at some ways uh, to do that. Um, and I'm going to go right back to kind of uh, the education issues during COVID. So again, uh, when we think about like public education and what's happening right now, we know that, you know, students who are prepared, we're, they're going to be okay, like the prepared students, the one who know how to navigate the internet and have access to their own device and have access to the internet and, you know, have all these things. They're going to be okay, but it's those students that, and that's the majority of students are, you know, struggling and they need help particularly, again, working class uh, communities and, uh, you know, who don't have access maybe to the same kind of technology. Rural communities uh, may not have the access to the same technology. There's language barriers as well, too, and particularly special education students. I mean, I think what we are realizing and, and is that how important education, public education is to communities and that what a safety net it is and the value of it. Um, so that's been incredible to witness, but at the same time, it's heartbreaking uh, to, to know that there are students uh, that some educators are not even able to get in contact with. It's really difficult for parents to try to keep up with this distance learning. Um, they're, not they're not equipped, our homes aren't equipped for that. You know, So it's a real struggle and uh, ed educators are definitely feeling that too and really feeling for the communities and trying to do their best uh, but it is really uh, stressful. Um, in terms of, of course, healthcare, we know the lack of access to so many communities, particularly indigenous communities and remote communities. Um, mental health, uh, you know, people who have mental health issues, really difficult time, and they're already under, there's not enough services. And then um, long-term care homes. And, you know, long-term care homes, wow, they've been hit so hard. And again, we know for so long, they've been privatizing long-term uh, care homes. And you know, it's uh, so sad uh, and devastating to see the impact on such vulnerable elderly people and then being devastated because of the greed, uh, you know, of few, uh, of a very few. So uh, the impacts, uh, again, of the most vulnerable, we see statistics coming out of the United States around black communities. Unfortunately, Canada does not uh, collect data uh, around race, which is appalling and they need to be because we need the data. We know 
uh, already that there are underlying health conditions in black communities, in indigenous and people of color communities. So they're already more, gonna be more susceptible. Uh, and then again, when we look at low paying jobs and all of those kinds of things, uh, so many health risks and uh, we don't have the statistics. And so I know that there's been a call out from uh, many uh, black activists in the community. And there's a statement you could look up as well too. And in Nova Scotia as well too, the black community has also spoken out around how COVID-19 is particularly affecting uh, them. Uh, also for two-spirited LGBTQ folks, it's also extremely isolating. Some people are in homes where they're not out and they have uh, their experience, they may be experiencing a lot more violence uh, and they could uh, also be very isolated. Um, and then I know it was mentioned too, the anti-Asian racism, which is uh, also on, very much on the rise and we've seen people be uh, attacked and in the United States, a president that, uh, you know, saying racist things and fueling uh, this kind of racism. Uh, so, uh, I also just wanted to sort of end with uh, resistance. And I was listening to a webcast with Arundhati Roy, and she was talking about, uh, you know, Kashmir and the lockdown. And of course, many of you know, Kashmir has been a lockdown for a very long time. Um, and but, you know, as she said, there's no lockdown, however, on arrests, there's no lockdown on hate. And uh, there's a lot. Uh, unfortunately, hate is being fueled. Uh, as was talked about earlier as well, too. There's also like trying to inculcate through the media a normalization of uh, cultivating fear. Uh, and so, you know, we know that there are many resistance movements going on. Wet'suwet'en was happening just before COVID and what a powerful movement that is. What's happening now with the pipeline? What's going on with, uh, with those resistances? We need to uh, be looking at that. People are agreeing to things now to have access to track people because of COVID. And I think through this cultivation like of fear, people are gonna be agreeing to things that they never would have before. So she called them technologies of incarceration um, and uh, you know, arresting people for not wearing masks. You know, We already know we have a corrupt, violent police state and giving them more authority is very scary and frightening for black, indigenous and people of color. Uh, so moving forward, again, I'm going to sort of tie it back to education and local bargaining, again, very challenging in the current environment. Um, of course, there are, you know, we have to seek opportunities to resist. And I do think I'm hopeful that maybe, you know, with some consciousness raising that people are seeing, not just saying, oh, yeah, you're a superhero, but actually uh, demanding, you know, uh, demanding workers' rights out of this and not just like, you're great, uh, you know, here, let me buy you a drink, like, you know, a beer for a buck or something. Anyway, uh, so, you know, like it, it, that it's a lot more than just that. Um, and uh, again, the attack on public sector workers and also education particularly, you know, is a, an attack on women's work uh, because again, we do dominate particularly elementary uh, teaching profession. And uh, we need to be thinking about how when students are back for the, you know, there's going to be a gap for many students with this stopping of, uh, of education. And how is the education system going to respond? And what do school boards need to do? And what kind of funding needs to happen? Because there's going to be a lot of necessary uh, interventions that will need to take place um, the longer this goes on and the, long that the longer that they're away, uh, you know, from being with, uh, you know, in sort of in school. Um, so I just wanted to end, you know, I love the, the, the theme of this vision of a better world. So to think about, you know, how we can imagine and take care of each other through community um, and to think about how we can vision for a better world. You know, I, again, Arundhati Roy talks that the pandemic is a portal and, you know, how are we going to walk through that portal? Is it going to be uh, with this this sort of terrible colonial imperialist like the sort of uh, you know deathly uh, way of walking through this port are we going to drag those things along or are we going to you know sort of embrace more light ways of living indigenous ways of living and getting back to uh, I think you know Jennifer said like our needs like and and what they truly are and our roots so thank you so much again to the Mayday committee and uh, for putting this on Thank you so much, Pam. That, Pam, was, that was incredible. Yeah. Thank you. Everybody's cheering you on. The chat room has been alive with all these comments. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you very much.
Yeah. So I think now really I'm going to bring in a video about the migrants' rights. Um, that some of the issues that Pamela also touched upon. In a public health crisis, unless we protect everyone, we cannot. Okay, so I think we're missing a little bit of the audio here. Um, should be back now. Okay, all right. Sorry about that. In a public health crisis, unless we protect everyone, we cannot protect anyone. I got my wife that is, her due date is on May 29th. Me and my wife, we don't have an SIN, a valid SIN number. And still we are asked to be stay home. Uh, but the reality is that I cannot stay home. I don't have any kind of support. I need to hustle basically every day. Ahora con el problema del COVID-19, no he podido ir a trabajar a Canadá. Y como nuestros ingresos económicos es con el trabajo que realizamos en Canadá, me encuentro en apuros económicos para solventar gastos en mi familia. We cannot imagine ourselves on the street with our kids, having no way to provide them any food. La, los indocumentados, nosotros también somos humanos, nosotros también trabajamos y contribuimos fuertemente a la economía, a nuestro trabajo, nuestra mano de obra, que permite que siga funcionando esta máquina de la economía. Nosotras limpiamos, cuidamos eh, las casas de otras mujeres, las, las que trabajamos como domésticas, cuidamos niños, ancianos. Hacemos limpieza en hospitales, supermercados, trabajamos en los campos, en las fábricas. Nuestra mano de obra se encuentra en todos los sectores de, de, de la economía. Myself and all my coworkers were all laid off um, as a result of losing my job and also not qualifying for support because my sentence expired. Um, I have no idea how I'm going to be able to pay for rent and food. I still need to eat and live. I believe we also should not be left behind. We contributed to Canada. I hope to get a fair and fair justice. All migrants in Canada must have income support. It's very really hard for me to believe that migrants like myself and all migrants cannot support, uh, cannot get support because of a formality like expired uh, social social insurance number. I'm ready to work. I'm ready to do what it takes to be a resident here. That I also include fighting for my rights as a worker, regardless of my status. It is absolutely urgent that the government immediately extend income support to all workers who have been affected by COVID-19, regardless of their immigration status. Amazing. Thank you so much. This is a very powerful video. I want to thank Jay Watts, who has been putting together all of these video clips. So he's doing a lot of work behind the scenes. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Alex, to Magdalena Thanks, Torres for uh, moderating the chat room as well. That was a really powerful video. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. All the personal uh, experiences and everything. And what Pam mentioned uh, too, Kieran, like she had mentioned so many important things, not just about the education workers struggle, but about just struggle, migrant workers struggle, uh, regular you know, community workers struggle, it's the struggle of, of workers who are really marginalized because of racism. So this is something that 
yes, these struggles are deep, they're real, they're raw, but collectively, and I loved how Pam touched on that as well, collectively, when we unite, when we come together, we can we can continue to challenge all of these these oppressive forces, right? Absolutely. And, um, yeah. In so fact, that's the only way we can really do it, you know, because the powers that be, they can pluck us off separately. But once we come together like a fist, we're much harder to break. So that's the important part is to come together as a fist. That's right. Way <laughs> to go. <laughs> Hi, Charles. Not He's move. sitting in the green room there. <laughs> He's I'm going up. to introduce <laughs> Charles Smith. He is a poet. Uh, he is, uh, Charles has written and edited 14 books. Wow. He studied poetry with William Packard at New York University, edited three collections of poetry, and his poetry has appeared in numerous journals and magazines, including Poetry Canada Review, The Quill and Choir, Descant, Dandelion, and Fiddlehead. His recent books include Travelogue of the Bereaved, Whispers in 2014 and Destination Out in 2018. So I'm pl pleased to welcome Charles Smith. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Virtual applause. Thank you. Thank you. I think I am unmuted, so I hope everyone can hear me. You can. Cool. Um, yeah, wow. Uh, thanks for having me uh, with you this evening and for uh, being able to see what has come before I um, you know, give you a, a gift to this evening. Uh, and um, to the committee and to the day in and of itself. Um, I was really struck by Ben's comment about Cuban doctors uh, and their efforts um, around the world. So I wanna begin with a poem uh, about um, a rather important poet to me, and I think also a very important poet to the Cuban revolution, uh, Nicholas Guillén. And it's called Starting Points. I'm just going to read a couple of poems, and they'll be mostly about historic uh, figures who have, who have uh, struggled for um, justice, equality, anti-colonial uh, interests, and so on. So this is Starting Points. You wrote of Spanish marble, of sparkling silver swords and conquistador ships, galleons of gold coins and black maidens, and of your skin, that black mark, and of the blood flooding like the Niger through your veins. This was a message, a beat played upon the drum of paper by hands as soft as tears. The Twene Boa could not speak, so you were the Atumpon, a calm rhythm in the violet night. My ear was close to your drum. I heard the cone, 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 cone beating through the day, thought of the things I wanted to say, then beat this back to you. What were Mandingo, Ibo, Congo, Dahomey? What words did their drums utter in the humid nights like wind against the odom trees? What were these lands that stretched across the continent the shape of a dark, upturned hand? To hear your reply, I needed a suman, but this had been hidden beneath stretched calfskin. You knew this but my ears could only hear rumblings inside buildings of North American cities. Here, the Atumpan has been silenced by the drums of industry. And you have moved closer to the Hamatan. The ghosts of Shaka, Ose Tutu, Kadaya awaited you. The Koroba played Demarifa Due. Quietly, you lay inside a house while a small man painted the faces of the dead. Um, you know, it's interesting how we look back at ourselves in time and what our ancestors have done in our struggles. And I'm struck by that um, memory of Guillen and reading his work, uh, but also of those who struggled here in this Canadian soil, um, particularly women. And this is a poem to Marie Joseph Angelique and Phyllis Wheatley. Uh, two women of African descent, one in Montreal, the other in um, Boston. And uh, I'm hearing some music in the background. Hold on a second. I'm just trying to... I believe that's Jennifer. Okay. Uh, we okay to continue? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. So this is called Death by 30. 
And it's for Marie Joseph Angelique and Phyllis Wheatley. Just if those who don't know, Marie Joseph Angelique was the uh, black slave woman who was executed for allegedly burning down Montreal in protest about her being enslaved. Phyllis Wheatley, on the other hand, was a black woman who was a slave but could write poetry. And there was this very interesting test to see whether or not her poetry was original or whether or not she was just mimicking. And they discovered that her poetry was actually original. And so they let her free. Um, now you can imagine a black woman being free in Boston in the 1760s, what that life might have been like. Anyway, it's called Death by 30 because they both died before they were 30. So you were both gone by then stretched into distances between who you really were and what you wore when your lungs went cold and you could not breathe and the sound of your own eyes shutting invited the curved limits of night. How did this happen? One compelled by violence, the flame that took down a city, the other cursed with freedom and away with words. One confessing innocence over and over until tortured, the other abandoned by poetry and the arms of a man. Each of you went ablaze in your eyes, extinguishing all light, purseless, with nothing to spend to end your suffering. The impact of um, colonization, particularly in black bodies, is most known through slavery the uh, treatment of humans as chattel, as property, as subhuman, and the placement of those bodies as on, you know, basically these cattle um, up to the current day of, um, you know, assassinations, uh, police harassment um, that have led to now Black Lives Matter, but in the civil rights struggle led to the assassination of Martin Luther King, um, Malcolm X, and we have our struggles here with leaders as well. Um, so this next poem is for, I think, two people who are very um, ahead of their time uh, in different ways, Charlie Parker and Martin Luther King Jr. And the poem is called Paradox. In the final moment, it's what we learn from the body, how it is seen atop a sterile clone table, covered in white cloth, the blood now stuck in the breath. Whether the mouth was a sax or a microphone, it wore out all their stress and became an addiction with the openness of moonlight pushing in on their dark brown foreheads. It was then they were held to God, truth, and white powder, their full weight lying inert. Some doctor poked each with a tube, said, looks like someone in his 60s even though they both beat this by more than 20 years. This is what it ate of them, the hate and bitterness, envy and long solitudes, a penetrating sight showed in their lungs, scarred tissue along the heart's wall, gave sign they had both beyond, lived beyond the time any might suspect from their birth certificates, 34 and 39, and what that remains to tell in their absence. They each define what the world could only show them, violence at first instance, stinging like sorrow, their nostrils clogged with pain. So you can notice the relationship between death in the poem about um, Marie Joseph Angelique and this one. Um, it comes in different ways, but it comes. And that sense of uh, when the doctors did actually examine the bodies of both Charlie Parker and uh, Martin Luther King Jr., they had found that they had aged 20 or so years beyond what they actually, how old they actually were. And that's what I call the stress of racism, um, that, you know, we, we get up each day to battle this thing, and it's wearying, it's tiring. I remember one civil rights leader just getting up and saying over and over again, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. Um, speaking of tired in our present day, this is a poem for Mumia. And so we read the protest of his announced death, the words like rusted daggers, each syllable speaking so many centuries, when we relied on hope, when weapons were unavailable, we sought deliverance in the heart of snails. What was discovered was undeniable. We wrapped our wounds in tissue paper to keep blood from flooding our arms. 
Nothing seemed given in return. We got what we took, the raw wraps of heaven, rainbows floating into an exuberance rarely seen. What flew over us on this flight on this ocean, salted with bodies, the sick, suicidal, mad, we felt their breaths like aches in our bones. So many handed down after so many centuries. What it must have been like not being able to swim in a vast, relentless, deep and cold ocean or spatted bone and blood between leg and wrist signs long after we let go our bowels in the bottom of a boat destined to death or a new world. And now, another 500 years later, another black man they want to die. In a time when they say all are equal, we are caught in this moment like smoke in distant trees. I'm going to read uh, one more uh, because, you know, uh, um, Gene will probably remember this character, Dominic as well, Charles Mills, <laughs> and his work around racial polity, um, you know, leads to this question about how do we struggle against these uh, forces and how do we see, uh, as Pam and Ben talked about, the connections that we have both locally and globally. And, you know, Charles talks about how do we look at struggles of the past and learn about how to, um, what worked then and how we might uh, put forward now. So I want us to remember that we have been engaged in struggle throughout time. And so this poem is called A Poem for Any Time, Like Now. Wind over waters like a hand touching a face. The city an old sore upon the heavy earth. Sky so blue they create an infinity separate from any existence. A sock from a shoe only in the imagination whose pearls are a sequel of longing that is not yours nor mine, but belongs to the particular person caught at the particular moment in the particular act. Perhaps he will be black or that he will be a she and she will be black and they will hire her to kill one boulder with two stats can CEIC unemployment classifications they can pay less than minimum wage. It will not be some job in a sweatshop. God has long since learned the tricks of technology, operate state-of-the-art Apple II computers, some scientific atom invented, Werner von Braun in the labs of Fritz Lang's metropolis, Berlin or Cape Kennedy, what difference? He is not a Jew, nor are his creations. He has built a pandemonium on top of Milton's pandemonium. They call it space shuttle, exploration, Star Wars. They call it civilization, progress, democracy, move over. They are hurtling from darkness into darkness. No, this time it is not Africa, Chile, India, China, Vietnam. This time it is not gas chambers, ovens, sharecropper shacks, apartheid, lynch mobs. This time they call it escape, Get away, let's beat it. The village is burning the goddamn black plague. They mean black people. They have been running from since the Middle Ages. They call it barbarians always on the border. They call it polite names and wish you would sleep. But the waters rise up in flame with the winds. A torch for a hand, a slap in the face. Earth sore an old infringement heavy upon the city. So Romulus killed Remus, built Rome, and cursed his children, made tar babies of them all, who later told stories of what happens when you are reared by wolves. That's it for me. Um, again, I want to thank um, the committee for having me here this evening and, um, and for those who spoke before me and those coming on after. And, um, you know, in signing off um, for this, say, may the first be with us all. Yes, let's wow. do a let's do a virtual. That was wow, wow, Charles. That was I could listen to that for at, at least six or seven more hours. That was very powerful. Thank you so much, Charles. That was really good. Ooh. I have That's to say, true. like this, like for a virtual event. Yeah, this is feeling pretty good to me. I mean, how how are you feeling? Well, you know, I think. If you had, if we had done this like six months ago, it would have been like, okay, just another live stream. But now this has become so normal, right? This is like the no new normal. It is. Yeah. And it's, I don't know. I've kind of gotten worked from, uh, gotten used to doing it from work, but, um, but just the speaker, like Charles and Pam and Ben, yeah. everybody is really harnessing the, um, 
the sentiment of what today is about and and really able to kind of throw that out there in this technology world. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, and I'm just, I'm so <laughs> grateful to all of them. <laughs> I love how animated you are. <laughs> I know. Sorry. It's just, yeah, it's just okay. what I do. It's my thing. Um, but Kieran, do we have another video or do, do we want to go into, what do we want to do right now? We have a couple of short videos that okay. are very timely. Uh, they're I mean, about we are running ways... a bit late, but I think everybody's sorry? okay. I think we are running a bit over time, I but I think, you. Oh. I think, I feel like we're good. We're 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 good though. Like let's watch some videos then. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Now okay, good. Um, I'm going to put up a video that's uh, about the ongoing COVID crisis. Uh, I know we're all sick of hearing about it, but this is a very specific video about uh, there's actually a couple of videos of this kind that I might play. Uh, one of them is going to be about um, how socialist country, uh, well, socialist uh, regions like Kerala, uh, and other countries, uh, they're both going to be about how socialist states as well as socialist uh, communities are dealing with this crisis, you know, compared to how we're dealing with it out here in capital world, capitalist world, right? So it's they're, they're going to be enlightening. You might already know some of this info, but for a lot of people, this might be new. So we're going to play something. Thanks, Kieran. ¿Cuántos tienen ustedes ahí para que me manden un trago? Que estoy pamao. So Kerala in India is an amazing place where we see a leftist government, a people's government, and we can see the difference in how these governments of Cuba, Venezuela, um, Vietnam, China, Kerala, 
have dealt with the coronavirus crisis in a completely different way. And, um, you know, the difference, the stark difference between those countries as well as the countries that we live in, you know, the U.S., Canada, where there's massive inequality. It's something that we really, you know, we can see what the world looks like when workers run it versus what the world looks like when the ruling class, the billionaires run it. Totally. And I think that's something we need to take away from that. Totally. So uh, here's another video. Go ahead, Jen. No, I was just saying that it, um, there was a couple of comments about the song playing in that video too. So not only like the, the video was, was powerful and the song music always makes things so much more, you know, powerful. Um, so I think Jay needs to help us out with, with what song that was in that video, just for the chat room discussion, if that can, that can happen. And also Kieran, if I can just. Yeah, Jay. Jay. Okay. Well, well, we'll we'll make sure it happens. Hi, so for those me? of you asking, we'll make sure it happens. Okay. Um, and yeah, for yeah, those we'll of make us it. We'll, joining, we'll we'll post it in the chat room. Yes, please. Yeah. And for those of us just joining, welcome. We still have speakers coming up and music videos. And Kieran, go for it. Like you were going to introduce another video. There's one more short you. video. There's one more short video that's on the COVID crisis. This is about Cuba. So let's play that. Okay, so that's Telesur. A lot of you are familiar with Telesur. They do great reporting. They're, they're one of the few socialist uh, worker, or, you know, oriented news media, international news media. So it's really important that we support them. Yeah, and the financial link What's up too. next? Yeah, sorry, Kieran, yes. but just, uh, just to mention again, like Telesur English specifically is, is one of our... Um, the people, the media sources that we agreed on as a committee to do financial appeals to help support. So again, please, there's the financial support link in the description bar. Please, please, please find a way, if you can, to donate to our, our event this evening so that we can support media like Telesaur English, The Gray Zone, and People's Voice. Also, Karen, we have one more one more speaker. Yeah, uh, we have one more speaker. Our speaker for the Communist Party of Canada. Yay! You want? To <laughs> Go ahead, Jen, if you want to. It's <laughs> like, yay, Communist Party of Canada, which I am a member of. I'm a member of the Public Sector uh, Workers Club in the Communist Party of Canada. Um, so I've heard uh, Jean speak before. And Kieran, you have as well. And she's incredible, like really. Um, and she is the final speaker of this evening. And, and um, but actually just before, just before I do her bio, I just wanna mention that even though Jean is our final speaker of the evening, we're still going to continue. You know, we're all stuck at home anyways, Kieran. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So we might as well continue the evening with some more videos and songs and, and especially a Faith Nolan, who is an iconic yes. socialist musician 
We're going to yeah, show gonna some, some fun times. Oh, yeah, right? Listen, gonna, I don't know about you, but like every day kind of blends into every other day for me. So for it me, it's, it's all it's all the same. We can I can stay here all night. It's fine. I know. Me too, actually. <laughs> And right, Sensei? But let's get mate, Jean on. Here all night. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully you all will continue to stay here with us. Right. But yeah, so, so, so Jean McGuire. Around. Yeah. And Jean McGuire is um, a member of the Communist Party, but she's also a longtime activist in a number of areas. Founding member of the anti apartheid organization CCSA, past president of a Canada-wide women's organization, Congress of Canadian Women, yay, and the executive of Toronto Action for Chile. Jean has been a teacher, a broadcast journalist, and a civil, civil servant, active in every union to which she belonged, and always a supporter of working people as they struggle to improve their lives. Here is Jean McGuire. And she is here tonight representing the Communist Party of Canada. Welcome, Jean. Virtual applause. Thank you very much, uh, Jen and Kieran, and to all the committee who have really done an excellent job. It must be very difficult to try and coordinate all these different parts that you've put together so incredibly well. Um, so I have to thank them. I have to thank all your other speakers and performers. I, it's been a wonderful evening to to be part of it and to hear all those incredibly Im impressive uh, um, presentations that have been made by Ben and by Pam and and uh, by Charles. It's nice to see Charles again. It's been a long time, Charles. Um, you know, sisters and brothers, comrades and friends, it's strange to be celebrating May Day in the middle of a pandemic and at the very beginning of an economic crisis. And I'm going to talk about um, those two things tonight because that's really where we're at. You know, we're, we're, we're all obsessing about it. The economic crisis that we're experiencing and will continue to experience was already in the making before the pandemic. But the scale of this economic crisis both precipitated by and amplified by the health crisis is looking increasingly likely to become even more severe than the Great Depression of the 1930s. I won't give you all the stats. They're all over the news. Unemployment figures, numbers for applications for emergency benefits, numbers of businesses declaring bankruptcy, huge numbers and getting bigger. We're already hearing predictions that during this crisis, unemployment is going to surpass the figures of the 30s. It's going to be bad. And as always, when the system crashes, it's the working class which is crushed under its collapsing weight. The corporations, the owners of big business, insist the working class do its part to help them out of their crisis by lowering labor's costs. Many will be laid off beyond the layoffs that the pandemic has imposed through isolation and the forced closure of businesses and services. Businesses already on the edge or too small to weather the effects of the pandemic are going under. Those who still have a job will be under severe pressure to accept a lower wage benefit package than they presently receive, either immediately or through the passage of time without any improvements. New job applicants will be offered jobs at a rate lower than it was previously paid or be asked to accept part-time or contract work. And at the very least, demands for improvement in wages or benefits will be treated as outrageous, bordering on mindless. And as usual, when those who suffer the most during the good times will suffer even more as we go into a recession or a depression, the poor, the precariously employed, the women, the indigenous communities, the racialized, the homeless, all of the disadvantaged of our society will experience an intensification of that disadvantage. We know how the governments beholden to the corporations are planning to solve this crisis. The first thing to say is that they will hide behind the pandemic, introduce policies to fight the economic crisis and claim they are fighting the pandemic. As Obama's chief of staff so famously said, never let a crisis go to waste. They may be fighting the pandemic, 
but they are also already fighting the recession. They will use the pandemic as a screen behind which they will transfer obscene amounts of money from the working class to the large corporations. It's already happening as the bailout packages are used to bolster the corporate world. Airlines that were buying back their own stock to prop up the price are receiving promises of help. Banks bailed out in 2008, 2009 are back at the trough, looking to offset their losses from what will be a rising tide of unpaid debts. Corporations that transferred jobs to low wage economies and destroyed the communities they left behind have arrived with their hands out. In Canada, the fund to pay workers 75% of their wages while the businesses are closed is being paid not to the workers, but to the enterprises who employ them to keep them on the payroll. This is purportedly to maintain the employment link, but it will be a gift to the corporations, which comes out of the taxes of working people. In the United States, the amount that will be spent on the bailout is predicted to reach $6.2 trillion. 4.5 trillion of that is slated for the large corporations, some of the obscene amount of money that I referred. The remaining 1.4 trillion will be shared between small business, local and state governments, hospitals, many of which are part of large corporations, and individuals. The figure that is being estimated for individuals is $500 billion, which works out to only $1,200 each, and that's what they're getting, $1,200. They will use the medical crisis to enact legislation, allowing greater infringement on the democratic rights of the people. Tracking devices, facial recognition, surveillance of the population, censorship, detention without trial, deployment of soldiers, expansion of police powers. In one country or another, all of these measures have been proposed or already enacted. And all of the measures introduced now in the guise of the fight against the pandemic will be used to limit opposition to and to quell the struggle against the consequences of the economic crisis that we are in and which will continue and grow. They will use this crisis to pursue their long-term foreign policy objectives, free from the scrutiny to which it would normally be subjected. Who is watching the escalation of threats to Venezuela when there is a pandemic at the door? Trump's apparently mindless twittering about the Chinese virus is not mindless. It is an expression of the pre-existing hostility that has been growing on the part of American corporate rulers to the burgeoning world strength of China. Who is paying attention to the plight of Haiti, Iran, Syria, Palestine? The sanctions and boycotts isolation and embargoes, threat of military intervention and blockades under the conditions of a pandemic are not a continuation of policy, but an escalation of hostilities. It is callous and brutal, a crime against humanity to refuse any nation access to the wherewithal to fight a pandemic. So that is what the corporate elite and the governments and their governments will offer as a solution to the crisis we are in and which will get worse even after the pandemic is over. The transfer of incomprehensible amounts of money from our pockets to theirs. The introduction of repressive legislation to limit opposition to their economic policies. The intensification of policies against any nation which would resist their unimpeded access to the entire world's resources and markets. And what is the alternative to that? What is our alternative? The first thing we need to do, if for no other reason than that this will not be the only pandemic that we see in the years ahead, fix the healthcare system. That system has taken a beating, years of austerity, of cuts and even more cuts, of governments that subjected the healthcare system to corporate supply chain policies just in time or on demand, as if healthcare was a t-shirt or a pizza to be made when somebody ordered it. It is these policies that has resulted in a system cracking under the weight of this emergency. We must reject the corporate mantra of lean and mean. We want a healthcare system not lean, but well-fed, not mean, but resilient, strong enough to still function during the medical crises. 
it's time to reverse the cuts and expand the number of beds, the number of staff, the number of hospitals, expand our notion of healthcare to include dental health, mental health, vision and hearing care, long-term care for the elderly. It's time not only for free, pres free prescriptions, but for the development of a socially owned Canadian pharmaceutical industry based on research that is socially funded and owned so that the next time a medical crisis arrives and arrive it will, the system can handle it. And let's make sure that when a vaccine is developed, it is owned publicly, not privately, universally available, not a commodity for profit. Use the bailout money to fund the construction of affordable housing and not just affordable, but social housing. Use that money to provide employment insurance income for all workers at 90% of previous income without any cutoff. To introduce a guaranteed annual livable income to provide not a net, but a floor through which people will not be allowed to fall. It's time to improve all the social services that have been gutted and we need to raise pensions. Make the Bank of Canada the lending institution for government. Ensure that any money given to corporations comes with public equity in the company. And where there is a public interest, the pharmaceutical industry, insurance and others, nationalize them. Give financial support to small businesses, farmers, fishers, single proprietor operators. Cut military spending to release even more funds to ameliorate the effects of the crisis. Stop all evictions, renovictions, and foreclosures. Cancel student debt and credit card debt. Defer all personal debt, mortgages, and loans. In fact, the American economist Michael Hudson proposes that all non-corporate debt should be just canceled, like hitting the reset button on your computer, reset the economy. He says it's been done in the past to good effect. We demand jobs, good jobs, value-added jobs. We want an end to precarious jobs because precarious jobs mean precarious incomes, precarious housing, precarious nutrition, precarious health, precarious lives. We want investment in infrastructure, public transit, clean water for indigenous communities, sustainable energy. We want the rights of the indigenous peoples and nations to be recognized and respected, including the right to have the final say over developments on their lands. And free public childcare is now an even greater necessity if women are not to be pushed out of the workforce by this crisis. Women are already feeling the effects of the layoffs disproportionately. For example, while women are only 47% of the workforce, they represent 63% of the job losses in March. If you take the age group 25 to 54, that number grows to 70% of the job losses. The number of women in that age group who lost their jobs is double the number of men in the same age group who lost theirs. 1.2 million women lost at least half of their work, work hours. And if you include those who lost their job, the total is 1.8 million women. That's one in five women who are in the workforce. 59% of all the jobs lost in March were either in sales or the service sector, sectors dominated by women, and it will only get worse. They measure the economy by the levels of profit. We measure it by the levels of employment and the level of the standard of living of the people. Their solution to the crisis is to demand policies to raise the rate of profits. Our solution is to demand policies to raise wages and living standards. When this pandemic is over, there will be a new front line, the front line in the campaign to defeat the policies that the corporations and their governments will try to impose on working people to resolve the economic crisis. And that's where we will need to be, on the front lines in the defense of jobs and wages and housing and services and the environment and democratic rights. But all those demands, they are reforms to the capitalist system. Necessary reforms, reforms needed to sustain and improve the lives of working people, necessary to stop the owners of big business from squeezing the working class harder and more thoroughly, 
to stop them from making us the solution as well as the victim of their crisis. When May Day was first established at the sixth conference of the Second International in 1904, they called on, quote, all socialist organizations and trade unions of all countries to demonstrate energetically on the 1st of May for the legal establishment of the eight hour day for the class demands of the proletariat and for universal peace, end of quote. All those demands I mentioned above are the modern day equivalent of calling for an eight hour day, an attempt to make working people's lives better. But May Day is about the support for the class demands of the proletariat and for universal peace. Peace is an easy demand to make, but hard to win. And I thank Ben for his very excellent talk about the threats to peace as we see it in the world today. But we, and we know what peace means. It's an end to wars of aggression, to interventions, to drone killings, to punitive sanctions and blockades and embargoes. But what are the class demands of the proletariat that we should support? That means going beyond trying to fix the system, a system which can never meet the needs of working of people, a system which will continue to experience the cyclical recessions and which will continue to expect the working class to suck up the costs of recovery from each of those recessions. If we were to use a medical analogy, economic crises are the symptom. Capitalism is the disease. Reforms address the symptoms to reduce the damage that the crisis does. But we need to get rid of the disease, capitalism. We need to expose the system for what it is, based on exploitation, with growing inequality, increasing numbers of wars, incapable of solving the real issues of climate change and environmental degradation, and unable to offer anything but more of the same. Now more than ever, this analysis of the system is needed. Now more than ever, it will be heard. We must advocate for a change to the system, advocate for a new society based on the needs of working people and not the needs of the handful of giant corporations and the men and women who own them. Let that be our May Day message, that a world without exploitation, without want, or war without racism or sexism is not only desirable, but possible. And in the spirit of May Day, let us commit to join together and to do our utmost to convince others to join with us to make that possibility a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. Thank you so much. That was such power and Yes! Just, you, you, you are able to speak with the most rational points in the most powerful way. It's incredible. Thank you so much. And Kieran. Jean Jeez. McGuire from the Communist Party of Canada. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jean McGuire. Kieran, a better world is possible. A vision for a better world. Like I love that that um, Jean closed her, her speech with that. And I love, there's a part... Um, on the front lines of jobs like so we're all on the front lines for jobs for services and it's like wow yeah goosebumps thank you thank you thank you we still have so much more to demand and fight for as jean said and may day is about supporting the class demands of workers as jean said and we as workers are all connected we do have the collective power both economically and socially to make a dramatic impact when we work together. COVID-19 pandemic has further proven that us workers are the engine that makes the world go round. The silver lining in this current pandemic is the potential for mass awakening and consciousness of the collective working class that proves that we have the power always when we unite. And as Jean said, I'm gonna echo that sentiment because it was amazing. Capital, capitalism is a systemic virus and socialism is the cure. That's Kieran. right. That's right. <laughs> um, no, that was an amazing speech. And as always, uh, every time I hear Jean speak, I just 
I, I'm just fired up. I'm just fired up. And there's just so much powerful um, materialist analysis that Jean makes that it mm. just really drives the point home. So I just want to say thank you to everyone. We're going to continue the um, the program. We're going to have videos. We're going to have more music. But we are uh, also going, you know, this wraps up the speaking, the live speakers portion of the program. So we really want to thank all of our speakers, Ben, uh, Laureen Bluewater, uh, Charles C. Smith, Pamela Do Dogra, <laughs> Dogra um, and uh, the reason I laugh is because I mispronounced her name and then I was reminded because I'm also South Asian that I should not be mispronouncing a South Asian <laughs> name, but it was funny. Uh, but uh, you're so used, you get so used to anglicizing the names that then it's like you have to kind of go back anyway. So, um, and also of course, Jean, um, uh, Jean McGuire. So we're going to now um, have a, do you, uh, you want to take over, Jen? Well, I think that this, um, Jay, as we were going through this program tonight, Jay reminded us, one of our tech support people, that OPOC, who was an Indigenous elder who has so often and for so many years devoted his time to always do the opening for our May Day celebration every year in Toronto. And unfortunately, we lost him. He passed away this past year. and. Jay mentioned that, you know what, this would be a really good opportunity to commemorate him and to honor him. So Dominic, who you saw earlier, for those just joining, he uh, gave our financial appeal earlier. But Dominic knew OPAC really well. And Dom, are you there? Are you there, Dom? I am here. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. And Do also wanna... thanks for calling on me. I'm really honored as a United May Day committee member to say a word or two, and I'm sure that Patrick is listening and watching, and he also was a dear friend of Opuck's as well. You know, Opuck was not only a gentle and principled comrade, he was also a respected master singing bowl teacher. Mm -hmm. He was uh, an elder of the Eagle and Condor clans. He was also a very, very respected firekeeper. And I know that each year the United May Day Committee looked forward to hearing his land acknowledgement and his teaching, and we always learn something. And so, Opuck, we want you to know that today you're in our thoughts, and we offer this very short memorial on your behalf. Short, but poignant. Thanks, Dom. I remember the first time that I heard Opuck speak. It was a couple of years ago, which was my first time with the United May Day Committee. Mm -hmm. And it was a beautiful, uh, it was always a beautiful, and he always stayed for the whole program. And it was just yeah. really wonderful. So um, uh, um, here are my thoughts. And here's a video. Por mi amigo que está preso, porque ha dicho lo que piensa, por las flores arrancadas, por la hierba pisoteada, por los árboles podados, por los cuerpos torturados, yo te nombro libertad. Los dientes apretados por la rabia contenida, por el nudo en la garganta, por las bocas que no cantan. Thank you again to Jay for that amazing little video tribute. Um, you know. Are you uh, are you back here, Jen? I am. Yeah, there I am. Are. And and the the fact that Jay put this together in like what twenty minutes, Karen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just now, like there was there was a big. Uh, we had to you know scramble for a lot of stuff, but then Jay made sure that this tribute video was made just in time. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you. 
And again, thank you to the tech committee. Like Kieran, you especially, you know, you've really taken a lot of uh, leadership in, in making this event happen tonight and, you know, coordinating with the live speakers. Thank you so much to the live speakers. Yes. Big hand, big round of applause. Thank you so much to all the viewers. We do still have about five, probably 15 minutes or so of programming. However, before we close with some of the pre-recorded stuff, I'd like to bring Blue Waters in again. Uh, Blue, are you are you are you there? I am. All right. And Blue, that was um, a memorial that we just showed of uh, Opak, who has been, as you might have heard, the elder who has opened our event. Uh, for a number of years, and he passed this year, and we really miss him. And we welcome new beginnings, although we're honoring his memory as well. And we really welcome you and thank you for being here tonight to open and close this program for International Working Day, Working Workers Day. Thank you, Blue. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, it's always good when we start things off in a good way, no matter what we do. Um, to bring people together. And um, we started that way tonight by uh, asking those ancestors gone on before us and those ones yet to come uh, to be with us to help us do that work, to open our minds and our eyes and our ears and our, and our hearts and, and our voices. And uh, so I'm going to ask those ancestors to, uh, to go back to where they stay until we need them again for another day or another time when we, when we call upon them looking for help. Um, now, they're never fully away from us, but we're just asking them to not be so close to us tonight because we don't want to all head off into our directions and do whatever we're doing and, and hear them talking to us in our ears all night long and we don't get to go to sleep. And, <laughs> and that wouldn't be so, uh, so, so relaxing overnight. So when we call them in, we always send them back. So we ask them to go back to where they stay at this point. And uh, we've had some have and have heard from some wonderful speakers tonight who've shared their their wisdom and their knowledge and um, um, shared their words with us about what's needed in today's world. And uh, we find that, you know, some of us might be like, wow, I never really thought about those things. And it's really has opened up our minds. So we, we, uh, we're grateful for that, uh, those words of wisdom that have happened today and those expressions of knowledge that people have gained over their many years of doing this tireless work for for communities and for um, for those people who have been oppressed and continue to be oppressed and to um, bring equality um, to our, our working people <coughs> excuse me and those that are most in need um, yeah it's been a wonderful uh, time just sitting here and um, watching Watching the videos and listening to the people speak, I I wasn't quite sure I was going to stay for the whole thing, but it was so captivating that I I had to stay for the whole thing. So um, know that sometimes things that are um, I usually don't participate in or conversations that usually don't occur around me um, usually don't hold my attention that long. And this has held my attention for quite a long time. So um, I'm very grateful to those who have spoke tonight and uh, gave their presentations. Um, you had asked me earlier about uh, mentioning about uh, my my cooking videos, and um, uh, I have been making uh, cooking videos that I, I um, do live feeds on Facebook, and it started as a project for um, for the students from uh, uh, Seneca College and Fleming College, um, so that they would have a means of um, learning how to cook, uh, especially on a budget, because we know how students don't have a lot of money. And many of us don't have a lot of money nowadays mm -hmm. with what's going on in the world. Um, so it was started to um, provide that support um, for, for students. And then it just kind of morphed into um, people who had seen me post it on, uh, online. Because my first attempt was I just did it on Facebook Live. And then I had to set up a page. And Blue? So have, yeah? What's it called again, your Facebook page? It's called Cookham's Cooking Corner. So Good, cookum, cookum means uh, grandmother in Cree. So it's, uh, I had to learn how to set up that page. And once I did that, 
then everybody was sending people to that page. And so <laughs> it's been really amazing that, that a whole bunch of communities and from all over Canada and including people from the United States tune in now to watch that. So we do cooking nice. on a budget and provide comfort food, comfort in this time when people really need um, that assurance that we will be okay. Um, you know, I know our, our speaker, Jean there, you know, was giving us some histories of, you know, how bad things can be and how things look, right? And what we've gone through as people. But it, we still have to have that, that hope and that um, understanding that if we work together, um, which is what this is all about, right? Unity. This is about unity and equality for everyone. So if we work together uh, with each other and share the gifts that we have, um, we can be strong and we can get through any type of adversities that we face. So this cooking show was just a, a method of giving people a little bit of hope. And so it's, uh, um, it's really taken off and I'm happy. Basic things like making fry bread. Some of you may have had fry bread, yes. which is uh, one of the things people look forward to when they go to powwow <laughs> at different events. And things like soups and stews and everyday items that we can make and items that have been made from a long time ago. Um, you know, recipes from, from a long time ago that are still being used today because there is a lot of people living in poverty and being so oppressed that they don't have the same advantages of the rich and, and those that are in power. So these are ways for you to um, utilize things that, uh, that we can afford and we can make that are healthy and they're made with love and care and attention. And that helps nourish us as well. So I wanted to leave you with those things tonight about sharing and caring and, and sharing your gift. And, and always remember, no matter how bleak things are and how bleak things may look out there in the universe that, that we live in, um, don't be looking for gifts because you have to look no further than a mirror because you are the gift. Each and every one of us as human beings are the gifts and we can either um, make our gifts shine by sharing them with each other, or we can hoard them and hold them inside. And in which case it would be a waste of a gift. And that's something that we don't, uh, we're not supposed to do, right? We're not supposed to hoard our gifts. We're supposed to share them. So remember each and every person who's watching this and who may hear this, that um, you're the gift. Um, materialistic things come and go. Money we know that, you know, is, is, is not the best thing for us at most of the time, but the gift of our life love and our compassion and our kindness and our caring. That's what really matters in today's world. And especially at this time of COVID-19 in a time when people are so uncertain about what's going to happen, share your gift of, of song, dance, words, artistry, just share the gifts that you were born with and be that support for each other. And we can have a really strong nation and we can start building back up the world, not to what it was. We don't want to go back to what it was, we want to go forward in a different way where we can start things anew and, and start off in a different way, in a different pattern um, with a different way forward, which is to be kind and gentle and compassionate and caring to each other. So mm. have a good night, everyone. And uh, I wish you well on your journeys that you walk each day and uh, many blessings uh, for whom, whomever you pray to. May they hear your prayers and, uh, and keep you well and safe. Hi, hi, Miigwech. Hi, hi, Miigwech. Thank you, hi, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Blue. Hi, hi, Miigwech. That was really beautiful. And I think that's an important sentiment to take away um, as, you know, for International Workers' Day. But I think what Elder uh, Lorene Blue Waters mentioned is we are the gift. We are the gift to ourselves. When we're a gift to ourselves, we're a gift to each other. And together, we are a massive gift, right? Is that it, would that be kind of an accurate summary of, of what you what you closed with our our live session with? Exactly, exactly. Don't look for objects or things to be the gifts. We're the gifts. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I know that this is this is the first year that that Blue has joined our celebration as an Indigenous elder. And we so thank you, Blue, for, for coming on board and for sharing your thoughts and your wisdom and for honoring this evening with us together. Um, and thank you to Dom and Jay and Kieran for honoring 
our previous uh, predecessor, Blue's predecessor, <laughs> Opak, this evening as well. Um, and further, I think Opak would appreciate some of the videos we have coming up right now. And I just need to find my notes and we will get going. Here we go. Okay. Um, we Next do up, have we have Wally. Thank you, Kieran, for keeping me on track. Okay. And uh, you know what? I've only had two glasses of wine, so it's not about that. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing fine. It's just about, I have like about five screens open. I'm like, okay, where am I again? I know. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so, uh, and my attention deficit is really having a hard time with this stuff. Um, <laughs> so I, I just think the speakers tonight, Kieran, incredible incredible yeah i can't like it what a lineup that this was an amazing lineup and i'm just so glad that you know all of these speakers were supposed to uh be at the event that we were planning the usual event in toronto but now you get to have an international audience there's they they were seen and heard by people mm -hmm. you know all over canada and bc all over the world really yes. and it's uh you know it's 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 great that we are able to bring people together like this and that not just bring them together for the audience that was normally going to come to the event but also to a whole new, new audience that can you know and maybe we will continue to do a live stream next year and not just so. a in person event but i think we should do that both of them i think there's a yeah both. i think that'd be fun i think we should bring it up with the committee for sure we've had some people mention it on the chat room as well yeah. the chat room was quite lively tonight thank you it's so quite much. amazing yeah it's really nice to see everybody interacting so you know please do drop a note in there we really love to hear from you thank you Really, we would. And and if we do forget any any links um, and you have questions about some of the music or whatever, just send us an email. You know, you have our YouTube channel. You have our our unitedmayday.org, is it, Kieran? Or is it .org. Com, .org? Send us an email through that. We will do our best to, again, this is a, this is a small tech committee and it's our first, first year of doing this virtually. So, you know, there's some glitches and there might be some things that we missed and we apologize for that, but just let us know if we missed it. We'll, we'll make sure to, to give you that information. Again, I really want to say miigwetch to Laureen Blue Waters. I want to say miigwetch. Thank you to Pam Dogra. I want to say thank you to Ben Norton. I want to say thank you to Dom for coming and doing a financial appeal. To Camilla from Telesur. There's so many people to thank, and I want to say say thank you to live streaming is on. Okay, we're back, I believe. <laughs> um, I hope you guys are still with us. There was some kind of issue with the live stream. I'm not sure if we are back. If somebody can confirm that, that would I be think great. my my so my my <clears throat> my housemate is saying that we're back. Sensley, are we yeah. back on? You we're are not back, back on. on. We're not back on. Okay, there's a 15 yes, second lag. Okay, uh -huh. we're back. We're back. We're going to play Wally's video right now. Yeah, but let's just quickly, um, but, but Kieran, if I can just, Wally wanted to make sure that we introduced his video. There's an introduction um, built in. Yes. Oh, okay. Perfect. Wonderful. Go for it. Woohoo. Wally. Greetings. Sisters and brothers, comrades and friends, happy May Day. This is a video of a performance I gave last year at a celebration of Norman Bethune, the Canadian revolutionary doctor and internationalist. And I offer it here this evening in recognition of the 75th anniversary of the defeat of Nazi Germany, which will be observed next weekend. It's important to remember the decisive role of the Soviet Union in the war against fascism. As we celebrate May Day, we remember that fascism was then and remains today the enemy of all that working people hold dear. The song is called Meadowland. It was a popular Red Army marching song, and I play it here on the tenor saxophone.
Excellent. Thank you so much, Wally. And uh, we're back in the room. And Jennifer, do you have something for us? Well, I think that right after that amazing, like that made it have a bit of a live feel. So thank you so much for that, Wally. Wally's also a member of our May Day, United May Day Committee. That's right. Um, so it was nice to have him contribute that. I want to introduce a friend of mine who also contributed some music for this event, Faith Nolan. So to call Faith Nolan a folk singer, it doesn't come close to doing her justice. To date, she has recorded 16 CDs of songs. 16. That's that's incredible. Wow. Yeah, I know. Human rights are a recurring musical theme for her. Picket lines, rallies, jails, labor. And, you know, it, when I was a little baby dyke in my 20s, I remember seeing Faith. <laughs> you know, at an OCAP rally. I'm pretty sure it was an OCAP rally. It was like some rally, anti-war rally, OCAP rally. And there was Faith with her guitar, like just killing it with just getting people together to sing together, which is something she's so good at doing. Um, Faith has performed schools and festivals, actions and rallies, of course. She is Afro-Scotian, Mi'kmaq, and Irish from Nova Scotia. She's human righted and it's in her blood. She founded eight choirs, and a few a few are director of the QP Freedom Singers, has founded ETT, Voices of Freedom, <clears throat> excuse me, and Vanier Woman's Prisons Choir. So we're gonna play a video from Faith, <clears throat> excuse me, and then shortly after that, I think Kieran, there's some videos coming up uh, right after, but do we also wanna do the international. Yeah, I think we should do the international right after Faith. So or let's play we... Faith's video and okay. then we can, we can see how we go. And go with ahead. the international, do you think like, I think that people should like really pump up the volume. Yes, I yes, agree. yes. <laughs> it's 10 p.m., but it's it's a Friday and, you know, people are in different time zones, so it's fine. <laughs> okay, good. Noise violations don't count when it comes to the international. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's Faith Nolan, everybody. I want a free, a 
new Nigeria I want to be a free Nigeria I want to see free Nigeria I want to see free Nigeria mercy Nice. Wow. Very cool. Nigeria. That was so good. So much talent. Oh my God. So, and so much talent tonight, Kieran. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I'm amazed. <laughs> you know, Me I was too. thinking um, I'm in this committee for the last three years. This is my third one. And the reason I'm in it is because all year round, you know, we bust our butts and we work and we are organized or we're not organized because we work in precarious industries or we are, you know, getting laid off, getting uh, our, our per places of work are being shut down. But uh, this is the one day of the year where we get to just celebrate being who we are. It's the one day where we get to just celebrate with each other and re realize that it's about that solidarity and that solidarity comes through part, you know, um, this is the day to celebrate it. Every day we fight for our our rights for each other for so you know for um, better working conditions. But this is the day where we get to celebrate all of those people and all of the things that we do. So thank totally. you everyone. Yeah, thank you everyone. And Kieran, I think like part of like for me, I know like celebrating is also about recognizing the ongoing struggle, right? So Absolutely. it's because it is a struggle. Life is a struggle. I remember like years ago. I went to a moon circle and we were talking about, uh, we were just, a bunch of us women were there. We were talking about like, our experiences and the elder at the time said, life is a struggle. Marx has yeah. also said that, right? And it yeah. is, yeah. but it can also be about celebration of the struggle. Right. Let's celebrate what we're going to do together to make changes in the future. And what, how are we going to envision a better future together, which was the theme of our event tonight. Mm -hmm. and, and I really love that theme. And I, our committee, you know, collectively came up with and agreed on that theme. And I think it's important now more than ever during time of COVID times. Yeah, because it's hard to see a lot of times what's coming up, right? We And we know that a lot of dark times might be coming up. And the, the issue is that we need to be prepared. And for that, we need to take stock of what we have done and what we need yes. to do. And like, for example, Amazon, uh, Whole Foods, Target, uh, uh, Instacart, a lot of the workers in these precarious and these industries are striking and they striked today and um you know so these are ongoing struggles like you said on uh, on the international front there's still threats against uh venezuela cuba is still blockaded china is still being targeted by all kinds of um, racist and anti-communist rhetoric in the media and by politicians um all these countries are still under attack even uh, dprk as somebody mentioned as jay mentioned in our chat that uh kim jong-un there were these rumors that he's uh, died, but of course he's alive, which is DPRK is known for necromancy, apparently bringing back people who the West things have died, you know, because every so often we hear about that. So it, but it's amazing. So, you know, all everywhere worker struggles and worker states are under attack and we need to keep fighting back and we need to keep having solidarity with the workers of the world. Absolutely. On that note, <laughs> on that note, I just want to mention because Alex actually, um, one of our tech supports just mentioned, what about the foodsters thing? The yes. foodsters struggle right now. Yeah. Right. Like that's an important thing. So we have like Fudora workers who just like been been yeah. busting their butts to organize. Yeah. And now during the COVID epidemic, it's like, oh, in Canada, they're like, oh, you know, I'm just going to leave the country and like abandon all these workers while they're trying to like organize themselves and, and get some rights for themselves around, you know, uh, just basic bargaining rights, pay, job security, etc. Basic stuff, really, at this point. 
and yeah. you know they're like oh, they're, you know what they're, sorry they're part, yeah. of the, they're part of the gig economy right and the gig economy yeah. which is like uber and uber eats and instacart and all these uh precarious jobs where no you're not really hired but you know you're not even the the, the few rights that workers and have been able to uh just squeeze you know out of uh the ruling class, the billionaires, uh, the mm -hmm. capitalists, the precarious work doesn't even have that. Those those few um, strengths or the few protections that workers have been able to gain, because uh, when you work in a precarious industry, you're working 24 hours, seven days a week. You don't get mm -hmm. time off. You don't get sick days. You don't get benefits. You don't you know, you don't even get minimum pay wage most of the time so it's uh it's a really bad situation out there and these these share econ these sh the sharing economy the gig yeah. economy you know it's all part of that so void of economy <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah. and we need to we need to stand with the workers who are trying to organize within those industries as well 100 percent workers of the world unite Say it with me. Workers Ooh. of the world, of the world unite. unite. <laughs> but Kieran, I think we have the international, which of course is the theme song for workers of the world. It is our international theme song, right? Yeah. So what about these national anthems? Let's talk about the international. And yeah. I know Jay, I think, does Jay have it queued up yet or is it ready it's to ready. go? It's ready. We're ready to watch it and listen. I think we should all sing. Let's mute ourselves so we don't give ourselves feedback, but like, let's all sing. Let's, and let's. It, if, uh, if you're on YouTube, you can actually read the lyrics, Yay, the words. Karaoke. They're right on the in the description of the YouTube video. If you're watching on the website, you can click on the where it says YouTube on the bottom right side, and then you can open the description box. Uh, right, that's right under the video, and then you can read more. It says read more, and the words to the international are right there in case you need to read them. And just just before we go to that, I just want to just mention again, Kieran, like thank you so much to all of the work uh, of the all of the workers. <laughs> thank you the workers of course thank you to everybody for joining thank you to all of our speakers thank you for making our first ever virtual live stream event i think it was pretty successful i think so and thank you yeah. jen you've been very you know this was your first time emceeing or hosting yeah. and you've been yeah. great <laughs> so, so have you you brought so much energy oh i know it's and it's really fun to talk with you so i i don't even feel like i'm doing anything <laughs> and thank you to the tech team thank you to the mayday committee and thank you thank you thank you to everybody who is stepping up and making sure that we connect and unite and fight thank okay. you continue that let's sing the international together Mute your speakers so we don't feedback, okay, team? <laughs> and then let's continue with some videos and stuff after this. What do you say? Let's, let's do, do it. it. All right. Bye. Good night, everybody. But stay tuned. We're still going to play videos.
plug in my my microphone and my knee. <laughs> it's like, oh. woo! woo! Yeah, anyway, I, oh, that's, that's great. And we had a great uh, turnout in the... In, oh, there's Dominic throwing his fists in the air. Yeah, Dominic, throw your fists in the air. <laughs> Unmute yourself, Dom. Dom. <laughs> Jump in. Go Come right in, ahead. Dom. Come on. This is like, this is the party time now. So for those of you who who might be leaving because, hey, you know, after all, it is um, COVID I'm time. I'm still singing. Are you still singing? <laughs> I'm still singing. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> but I mean, this is, I think we should keep, we should keep going. We should keep I, going. You know, we have some more videos. We couldn't fit everything into a very tight schedule, which is amazing because uh, we have more content than we can actually play. So if, if you guys want to stick around, we're going to be playing a few more videos. Um, you know, we can also, um, yeah. We will be chatting and we'll be playing some more videos. So and sen and, and, and Sensile, my my house my my friend and housemate is laughing at me. She's like, "Oh, of course, Jennifer wants to keep going. <laughs> of, of course, Moxie wants to keep going. <laughs> That's what you're doing, aren't you?" <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, <laughs> this was a really really great celebr celebratory event. So I'm just saying thank you to my comrades. Um, for making this happen. Kieran, especially you, you deserve a big thanks and a big round of applause. Jay, Alex, the tech team, thank you, Toraj Magdalena, for moderating the uh, the live chat or assisting with that. And thank you to everybody again for joining in and making this happen. This Hello. is fantastic. Can you hear me again? Yeah, you cut okay, out. Great. But I, could, I, cut I, out I saw your beautiful face as like you were just kind of frozen, <laughs> but I was still like, hi, Kieran. <laughs> okay, so let's play some more videos. Um, I want to actually um, ask Jay if he wants to come on and, in, and introduce some of these videos. If you're interested, Jay. Hey. Jay Hello. Watts. Because you've made the videos. Are you camera shy? Okay. I think he's being camera shy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No problem. Because some of these videos, I don't know exactly the, what's in them. I haven't seen them because he, he's just bringing them out one by one after another. So I'm going. Oh, there's Jay. Hi, Jay. Hi, Jay. Hello. Hello. Ah, hi, comrade. <laughs> so tell us about the um, Communist Party Venezuela video, Jay, that I'm going to play next. I don't know what's happening, but just play whatever, please, comment. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. <laughs> Comrades and friends, the Communist Party of Venezuela would like to send you its greetings on this May Day when we commemorate Workers' Day in honor of the Chicago martyrs and all the workers who daily are on the front line of the class struggle against exploitative capitalist regimes. It is a day to promote international solidarity. Workers of all countries unite. It is said in the manifesto of the Communist Party of 1848. From the Communist Party of Venezuela, we are grateful for the solidarity we receive in this hard and dangerous confrontation of the working class and the working people against imperialism. It is the international solidarity that has allowed the Venezuelan people to keep fighting for their dignity is sovereignty after 20 years of Bolivarian revolution. The Communist Party of Venezuela continues to accompany the Venezuelan people in the midst of the current world pandemic of the coronavirus subjected to a criminal blockade and illegal sanctions. The reality of these days confirms to us what the eternal comrade Rosa Luxemburg pointed out that the struggle of the human race has only two perspectives, socialism or barbarism. We are fighting for life, for dignity, for social justice and for socialism. Long live the unity of the peoples. Long live the proletarian internationalism. Long live socialism. 
Long live socialism. That's the message. Long live the working class. Long live socialism. Let's play another video. Hey, Jen, you still around? Jennifer. Okay, I'm going to play another video. Uh, we have a video with some uh, by some uh, Samir Amin on migrant rights. So this is uh, another interesting video, and this also covers the same some of the similar topic. Jennifer, you're back. Oh, shoot. Hi. Hi. How are Sorry. you? I'm good. I just I just had to do a little bit of a bath, a bathroom break. <laughs> Sorry, oh. everybody. <laughs> it was like, you know what? I think these past three hours have went by so quickly. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I think that um, there's one more video that I have. It's about it's a it's a COVID. Uh, it's a it's a celebration of May Day in, in Greece. Bring it during the COVID uh, thing, which I think is really interesting. You know, like COVID uh, May Day is a huge celebration, right? Like in Cuba, for example, when I was uh, I haven't been there for May Day yet, but I know it's a huge celebration. I know some of the people in who are in our chat room uh, have been there for for that. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting how countries are handling that. So let's play, let's see how Greece is doing it.
Yes. Nice. It's so beautiful to see how people are still, you know, the, this is the working class. And you know what? This quarantine time will end and we're going to need to get back into uh, a, so a state of solidarity because yes. what's coming up, we're going to need to fight together. We need to enjoy ourselves on May Day. We need to do everything that we can to, you know, get that energy up. But then we need to remember that the fight will continue and the fight will continue Always. and we'll have to fight it together. Always. Yeah. We need to work towards collective achievements and fighting for what we all need as much as possible through every corner of the globe. Um, sorry if I'm babbling. <laughs> we have like another video by Benny Asgara <clears throat> I can play. Yes, yes. Oh, Kieran, do you have yeah. the uh, the community worker video by him? Because that is such I don't. If a you good can video. look him up, if you can look it up, I can play it. Totally. No yeah, I love that video so much. I'll look it okay. up. Okay. Let me play this one while you look it up. Go for it. I try to make my music something that reflects who I am. right back dedicated to all the people in Latin America right now rising up Dedicated to the people in Chile right now. You've been watching the news. There's mass upheavals going on right now. People who are fighting systemic oppression. Indigenous people in Ecuador, in the Amazon, in Bolivia, in Colombia. Bounce right back is the name of this piece.
Ecuador, fighting for systemic oppression, indigenous people in Ecuador. Like we're rising up, turn the volume up, like we're rising up. 
up, turn the volume up, black we rising up. La mano arriba, put them up. La mano arriba, hands up. La mano arriba, put them up. La mano arriba, la mano arriba, la mano arriba, la mano arriba. Now scream. Hands up. Thank you very much. That's my time. My name is Benny Esguerra. Whoa. Yeah, he's so good. That's amazing. <laughs> oh my god, I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to that again. No, you guys need to join me dancing though, because since like my, my she she's like sitting on the couch over there and she's like, I'm not coming into that camera. No, no, no. <laughs> Uh, so we're kind of dancing this social distance dance together, but it was still fun. You know, we're still having a good time. <laughs> that was oh, great. Man. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> oh my god, I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to that. Again. I think we Jay, have some feedback, we have feedback from Jay. <laughs> Jay, who, and, you're supposed to be social distancing. Who you got at your house there, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's listening to us. We it was our own sounds coming. Oh, back. was it? Oh, our oh. own voices from ten seconds ago coming back to haunt yeah, us. <laughs> so okay, well, what else do we have? Um, Did you I, get the link, Kieran, for the community work video from Betty Esquera? Yeah, I did. Okay, so I can play that. <clears throat> I love that song so much. But yeah. I also think it's really relevant. If I can just mention, it, it, just before we play this, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so I'm a frontline worker. I've been in the housing, shelter service sector, homeless, anti-poverty sector in the city of Toronto for 20 years. I'm aging myself here. But, um you know, during this time of COVID, it, it only highlights yeah, the extreme okay, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. poverty struggle. And Jay, we're getting feedback, bud. Uh, comrade, we're getting some feedback. Okay. Um, it, it, and we see it like on the streets. We have people sleeping outside. They're totally exposed to, to this pandemic. They're not getting the supports because things are just shut down. And this song, Community Work, it so resonates for me because we often, like, there are so many workers who just don't get appreciated. And COVID in some ways has been able to highlight those underappreciated workers. And, I mean, we know, we know that all workers are always appreciated. There's a role for all of us. It's always important. But um, this song is just, it just... The first time I heard it gave me goosebumps, and I just love it. So give it a go. Give it a play. Okay, here we go. Thank you. In the hood, there's a lot of love. In the hood. Not just about illegal drugs and crime. In the hood. Positive, productive activities go on. In the hood. All the time. In the hood. There's a lot of love. Not just about illegal drugs and crimes Positive, productive activities go on In the hood All the time In the hood They say live free spiritually with no attachments But I can't detach my work from life in government apartments Cause change that's really urgent starts at home and where you're working So I wrote this letter for you This is a homage to you Those on the front lines Change seekers, change Makers, real leaders, real mentors, all community caretakers, youth workers, support staff, early childhood educators, peace cultivators, poverty eliminators, or taking calls at late hours of the night, cause you know your clients' lives don't just work from 9 to 5. 
For all the thank yous that you never receive For all the love that you give For all the pain you relieve Overworked, underpaid All your dues overpaid Give your life but no tribute ever made For all the change that you created I wrote this note to salute you Cause it's time you're celebrated Tear you ever wiped, every hand you ever held, every smile you ever brought, everyone you always helped, guarding victims of abuse and violence, listening to stories of pain and anguish. For every funeral attended, every life that you lamented, every conflict that you ended, every cause that you defended, every gesture, every effort, grant submitted, applications, working years and still no pension, every sacrifice we think. For not turning you away Cause they may live far away For not sending seniors home Cause the funds may have been done Running program taking from your bank account While struggling to feed yourself You stay up every round When you live in a police state Jail becomes our kids' fate Your work is so important It's our only hope at this rate Thank you for bringing the neighbor back to the hood Thank you for building our communities And highlighting the good Community Work was the name of that piece, inspired by many of the people who I work with in the Jen and Finch community. Great. We have one more high energy song that we're going to play, and then we're going to probably start to wrap things up. Uh, here it is. This is, uh, this is a request by Jay Watts. So here we go. It's a Cuban song. Well, it's a Cuban reggaeton song. There's Jay. All right. Man, okay. <laughs> All right, let's play it. I love it. <laughs> what? I love, I love you all. Oh, we love you too, Jay. Okay, as long as you dance, we, we can play it. I'm up. I'm up. All right, good, good, good. Here we go. Oh, I miss Cuba. I miss Cuba. I miss Cuba. I miss Cuba. <laughs> I was just there for the first time. Um, like literally just before the lockdown, early, yeah. I was in heaven. Like I was just like, it's it's like love at first sight and then love at second sight and then love at third sight. <laughs> <laughs> so my first sight is there, and I'm gonna have the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. Viva Cuba! Viva Cuba! That's Viva right. Viva Cuba! <laughs> yes. Can you hear yeah. me, okay, Kieran? I can hear you just fine. I can see Jay. I can see Jay. Hello, Jay. <laughs> Jay. Oh, now we can't see Jay. Oh, now we can't see Jay. <laughs> Sorry, I totally got locked out for a second. I accidentally closed all my screens. I was like, oops, where's the link oh. to get back in? Oopsie. Anyway. You know, we've had surprisingly small, few number of glitches. I thought we were going to have way more. No. So considering that it's our first time, it's, in, you know, 
for a lot of us, this is new. A lot of the setup is new. Like we've I've worked with different components of this stuff before, but putting a live stream together was new. So you guys did amazing, honestly. You really Thank did. You. It was like a small little tech crew, Kieran. You mm. you were you were like main lead on the tech crew tonight, and honestly, like. You did amazing. Really. Oh, thank this you. This is our first ever live stream event. And Jay, whipping together videos, like, just, like, woof, out of your pocket. Like, hello. Yeah. And and Alex running all the back stuff, like, all With the toddlers running in his background. Yeah, cool. Yeah, he's got two babies, and he's still running two, like, three different uh, he's running the chat, live chat. He's running, making sure in the green room, we have a green room for the speakers that every, mm -hmm. everything is okay and making sure everybody's connections is okay. Connection is okay. And then just giving us little tips and advice about, you know, sound quality, this and that. So thank you, Alex, as well. Thank you, Jay, for all your creative work. Thank you, Jennifer. You did amazing. You are a brilliant. Moxie. Moxie, you're, <laughs> you did a brilliant, you're a brilliant host. I love your hair. No matter what you do, every, every week you do something different. Follow Moxie. Yeah. On Instagram, if you want to see different hairstyles well, every, every week, it's beautiful. Or my COVID <laughs> meltdown pictures. Or the other. Other. <laughs> uh, Oh, there's Alex. Hi, Alex. Hi, Alex. <laughs> Woo, hey. Cool, cool. Oh, wow. The whole team is here. <laughs> it's just great. I'm so glad. And we've got a good turnout. And I think it's going to be cool. Yeah. And I think we're going to take this forward to the next year yeah, i'm gonna that's play the other thing i think it'd be really fun to, to to continue this tradition in like a live stream i mean i think a lot of people are probably going to be tapping into that live streaming since we're getting so used to it now mm -hmm. you know moving forward to other events and rallies and stuff but um there's a lot of value in this yeah really totally it, yeah i i really enjoyed it and yeah. I really enjoyed. Of course, I, I love you guys. You're my comrades. I yeah. love being on this committee with you. Um, and let's just keep playing music. Yeah. And we got some donations, too. So thank you, everyone. If you still want to support the committee, we are all volunteers. All the money goes towards, you know, just basic expenses like uh, mm -hmm. website work or uh, in this case, website work, but generally also hold, hosting the event uh, at a venue and stuff like that. So we really appreciate all the support you've given us. Uh, usually we have drinks and everything and we have uh, drinks and a bar and- a Well, we food. are now. <laughs> well, we have our own now. So there we go. We still have all that. Just on our own. That's all. <laughs> and it's, in some ways it's a lot cheaper having your own bar at home. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you can just- Pick and choose, you know, whatever you want. So yeah. that's cool. So um, I'm gonna play one more video, and then I think we can uh, we can say we can wrap up. You know, yeah. for uh, we have one video that uh, was sent to us by um, Lucho, who is also in our committee. Yes. Um, and this is a uh, it's called El Viejo Comunista, and this is a uh, this just was released recent, like today Silvio or yesterday. Rodriguez. Silvio Rodriguez and Manuel Garcia. Uh, so yeah, let's play that and. It's it's a uh, it's a nice it's video. Mournful, it's mournful. It's mournful, but celebrate celebratory at the same time. It's it's slower video, but it's good because if we're gonna be sad trying... songs make me happy and inspired, man. Seriously. Yeah. All right, let's see. <laughs> Sus ojos a un día 
lejos Cuando a un libro, un verso, una muchacha, un pensamiento Cuando a un libro, un beso, una muchacha, un pensamiento Cree que ya nada lo sorprende Que se curó de espanto Desgastó el llanto Se curó de espanto Desgastó el llanto canciones que cantaba y conversaciones con amigos hasta el alba y conversaciones con amigos hasta el alba recordó la esquina de su casa cuando dijo adiós y vio a su madre really beautiful that was incredible that was so <laughs> moving and heart just heartfelt very mm -hmm. beautiful thank you lucho yeah yeah so i think we are approaching 11 p.m i think that we might want to <laughs> try to get some sleep tonight <laughs> No, come no, on. We gotta go till midnight till at least the end of International Workers' Day. I, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Kieran, thank you so much. I think we can wrap it up. Yeah, I think so. Jay, Jay seems to be doing some some. What are you doing back there? Your arm swinging. Jay's dancing. You dancing? Okay. Um, I just like would like to show you like my little my prop my my socialist. Uh, oh, tanky nice. propaganda in the background. Nice. Uh, Landon here. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me, but I just have. Oh, hi, hi, it's my buddy. Wow. Um, and then <laughs> I have my other buddy. Oh, that's yeah. that is adorable. My coworkers, when I left when I left my last job, they they got me these these. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. 
I have my uh, poster of Marx and Lenin. I can see. Um, I also have a picture of uh, Che, but it was just, I couldn't find. A, yes. I got this from Cuba. I love him. And then I got uh, these earrings. Uh, someone gave them to me. Oh, yeah, that was Jennifer. Can I point out, we oh, forgot I to wish. Them. We forgot to wish Lennon a happy birthday. <gasps> what? Okay, Alex, speak it loud and Alex, clear. I think we need you to speak up here and maybe put your camera on. <laughs> hey, hi. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but happy birthday, Lennon. Happy birthday, Lennon. Vladimir, Vladimir Lennon. <laughs> happy birthday, Lennon. <laughs> yes. But I, I did make those earrings. Yes, and while I was making those earrings, I was thinking about Lennon. There you go. With the polymer clay and stuff, and like, yeah, like Jennifer makes jewelry. She makes she's really good at it. Sometimes and all kinds of crafts and stuff, and yeah, it's pretty cool. Multi talented communist comrade oh, well. here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are too. Oh, I had such a great time with you all tonight. Thank you so much. Me too. Me too. This was really amazing. It went on very long uh, compared to what we were planning, but it was so super packed. Like I don't, I could keep packed going. And I, fun. If I wasn't exhausted and hungry, um, I'm I, hungry too. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> kind of hungry. <laughs> it's late, but I'm gonna have to eat something. All right, everybody. So thank you to the people who are still watching us, and to and thank you to the people who will be watching the video recording of this. If you stayed on this long, um, <laughs> thank you for thank you. Jay, to, I, I like it, Jay's finger finger movements in the side here. What what, what are you doing? What are you doing exactly, <laughs> Jay? <laughs> uh, Renzo, Renzo, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, remember, uh, thank you, everyone. If you uh, want to, you can support the United Mayday Committee by. Uh, via PayPal at donate at unitedmayday.org. Also keep an eye out on our website, unitedmayday.org. We're going to be having some more stuff on there. Uh, we're going to be doing, you know, some posting throughout the year, not just on, uh, not just for May Day, but we will have some stuff all throughout the year. We're, we're joining the 21st century. So, uh, yay. yay. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone. And yeah, Karen, have yourself a good night. Just really quick before we say our final, final, final goodbye. Um, will these links to financial appeals and stuff be be posted in the YouTube page as well as our website? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. In fact, as well as some of the videos and the music links and stuff, will that all be... Yeah. Jay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can put together a music list uh, of all the things that we played, and uh, we can also uh, the links to the donations are also already posted in both. Well, in our webpage, um, okay. unitedmayday.org, so that they're there. You can check them out tomorrow as well if you want. Super. And also, Magda, uh, Magdalena had sent that link from the United. Um, Mayday yeah, Mark, there's Mayday a we'll there's well. a playlist that uh, that uh, the United Mayday Committee uh, March committee uh has put it together and we'll put that up too okay i'm gonna listen to that now actually awesome Ooh. yeah Mwah. comrades Bye. such a great evening with you all thank you so much bye-bye thank, -bye. You, thank, thank you, you everyone and thank have you for, night, to everyone. everyone for attending thank you to all the speakers have a good night bye-bye thank you bye-bye oh, bella ciao bella, <laughs> bella.